Good morning uh, and welcome to the first meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee uh, and a good New Year to you all. Um, I would uh, um, ask uh, everyone who, uh, I should say, who doesn't require it to switch off um, mobile phones and tablet uh, devices or electronic equipment. Uh, sometimes that can um, interfere with uh, the system. But people will notice that uh, committee members and clerks and, uh, and, and others are, are using electronic devices um, uh, instead of hard copies of our papers. Can I first of all welcome Patrick Harvey, MSP, who joins us for uh, agenda item number four. Welcome, Patrick. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is a decision uh, on taking issues in private. Um, uh, and I uh, firstly invite the committee uh, to agree to say item uh, five in private today and at future meetings. Item five uh, is consideration of the themes that emerge from our evidence sessions on the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. Uh, is the committee agreed? Thank you. Uh, secondly, I invite the committee to agree to take item six in private today uh, and at future meetings. Item six uh, is our consideration of um, a draft stage one report on Mental Health Scotland Bill. Um, is the committee agreed? Thank you. Um, we now move to uh, uh, agenda item number two. Um, um, uh, and uh, the issue of uh, witness expenses in connection with our scrutiny uh, of the assisted suicide bill. I invite the committee to agree to delegate to me, as convener, responsibility for arranging uh, for the SPCB to pay under Rule 1243 any expenses witnesses on the bill uh, uh, can I have the committee's agreement? Yeah. Thank you. Agenda item number three then is um, uh, consideration of a legislative consent memorandum uh, from the Scottish uh, Government on the Health and Social Care, Safety and Quality Bill, which is a private member's bill in the UK Parliament. The committee um, previously agreed not to take evidence in this LCM. Um, the members will have had uh, the memorandum in their papers um, and um, I invite uh, members if they have any comments uh, at this stage. I don't see any member wishing to make any comment. Uh, I, 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 can I take therefore that the committee is content with the LCM and with the Scottish Government's view that the Scottish Parliament should consent to the UK Parliament legislation in this area? Thank you. And now we get to agenda item uh, uh, number four, um, uh, which is, sees the start of our stage one scrutiny of the Assisted Suicide Bill uh, Scotland. And our first uh, panel uh, of witnesses is uh, David Stevenson, QC, the Faculty of Advocates, uh, Professor Al Alison Britton, Convener of Society of Health and Medical Law Committee, Coral Riddle, Head of Professional Practice of, for the society, both of, of the Law Society Scotland. Uh, we also have Gary Flanagan, Detective Chief Superintendent Police Scotland, and Stephen McGowan, Procurator Fiscal, Major Crime and Fatalities Investigation, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Welcome to you all. Um, can I remind members that Mr McGowan has written uh, to provide us with details of the matters on which he may not speak because of judicial review. I also uh, have already welcomed Patrick Harvey, uh, the member in charge of the bill. Uh, Patrick is not here as a witness, uh, but may, of course, ask questions uh, of the witnesses through, through, through the convener. I will go straight to questions now, and our first question this morning is from um, uh, Dr Richard Simpson. Uh, th thank you, convener. Uh, the fact that the majority of the public appear to support this bill, I think, is wholly understandable <coughs> if one looks at it from the point of view that all of us would want autonomy over our own lives, including when we end those lives. But I have to say that as a, as a doctor who has, was a founder member of a hospice and uh, as a GP who dealt with a number of very difficult cases at, at the terminal stage, uh, I, I have great difficulties with this bill in one particular respect on which I'd like the witnesses' view. 
it, 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 it was my experience that the ones, the, that the patients who were most seeking to actually end their lives were ones who had reached that point in terminal care where they were actually unable to do anything about it themselves. I'm thinking of people particularly with motor neuron disease where they've reached the point where they're being um, ventilated mechanically and they are being fed, peg fed. And as I understand it, um, I may be wrong, but as I understand it, the, the individual must actually be assisted, but actually doesn't, uh, the, the assisting person does not actually perform the act of ending this person's life. So for that group of people, uh, you know, there is an exclusion. The other group of people for whom there is an exclusion, and I'm not sure quite how this is tackled, but I would like the witnesses' comment on, are those who have impaired cognition. Uh, clearly, if they are severely dementing, this bill excludes it because they cannot make an informed choice. But there are an increasing number of people who will make advanced statements or living wills um, and may reach the point, as occurred in one case in America, where something happens like a stroke and that they have expressed in an advanced statement that they wish not to continue with life in these circumstances. But actually, this was ignored by the doctors and they recovered. And at that point, they, um, they actually were grateful that they'd recovered. Now, I realize these issues are extremely difficult. But for me, those are two of the issues. The one about cognitive capacity uh, in situations where terminal illness and the fact of being so physically disabled that you're unable to actually perform the act yourself. Just one more thing on the cognition side, and that is that, um, no, no, I think I'll just leave it at that. I Thank think you those are two fairly big questions. Who would like to respond firstly? Anyone? Professor Britton, I think, you, <laughs> you, yeah, I think it's down to you now. <laughs> Good morning. I think um, I would like to start with the issue of the individual who is unable to take their own life um, without some form of assistance. I think what this does is highlight the importance of trying to have a clear definition about what actually constitutes assistance. Um, as you rightly point out, those with a progressive neurological disease or some form of other impairment may not be able to end their life either by use of drugs or by other substance or other means without some form of assistance. The proposed bill talks of the license facilitator using best endeavours to assist in this process. But given in section one we are talking about criminal liability, we need to be very clear what actually this assistance um, encompasses. And we need to be also clear at what point is there a demarcation where assistance is being given and that actually crosses over to being complicit in homicide. To the director's question. If I can, can come in, please, convener. Um, looking at section 18 of the bill, uh, Nothing of, no, no one is authorised to do anything that in itself causes the death. Um, it, causation is a, a rich vein um, of case law in Scots law, both criminally and civilly. Um, those, it's a matter which is still subject of argument in the courts on a regular basis. So I, I would support Alison Britton's point on that, that um, it, the line between uh, assisting someone and taking the act out of that person's hands is a fine one. There are also, um, I think, difficulties in relation to what is encouragement and support and uh, what might go into, uh, or what is support, rather, uh, and what goes into encouragement. And again, uh, the, the key part of this is that there is no definition of what assistance actually is and what it is to assist someone in suicide. And given that causation is a matter which is... Um, often a matter of controversy in the law, it, it's probably something that um, 
should be looked at in terms of um, definition and, and giving more specifics to the definition of what assisted suicide actually is. Otherwise, it does expose um, those who might seek to assist uh, others to criminal prosecution, which is obviously um, not desirable. Can I take um, um, Coral Riddle uh, and can I come back to you, Professor Britton? Just in relation to the first point about physical assistance, I would agree with Alison and a real challenge that society has identified has been the absence of definition of assistance. In comparison, in looking at the assisted dying bill, there is some further description and assistance there, which would include, for example, assisting a person to ingest or self-administer medicine. So I think there's a recognition there that there might be a further degree of assistance, but in the current definition, we don't sort of even have that spectrum. So I think, I think that that's an area that, that should be further fleshed out. I have a point on, in relation to the second point around impaired cognition, but I could come back to that if you'd rather deal with this first. Yeah, we, we, we can come back to that, I think. Um, uh, Professor Britton, do you wish to, wish to come back here? Just a brief point um, to follow through um, what you were saying. Uh, I know that the, the member in charge has pointed out that the spirit of this legislation is that it should be taken as a process. But the nature of our criminal law relies so heavily on causation that that's what will be the focus. The action, the mens rea, the intention, and then whether or not there's a public interest in any prosecution going forward. So it's very difficult to take this as an entire process. We have to focus on what the assistance actually is in isolation because that will be the person that will have to take the ultimate responsibility of the consequences of their act. Yes, I'm just uh, I'm really reiterating what uh, the other witnesses have said. Any confusion was likely to lead to uh, a police investigation, which is what I think most people would seek to avoid, and that that would be the, you know, that would be the um, that would be the consequence of a, of a lack of clarity around a specific issue. The uh, provision in the bill that tries to deal with this is Section 18, and um, it, it, it seeks to draw a distinction between assisted suicide and an act of euthanasia. And in subsection 3, it, it uh, says that the requirement, uh, which is referred to earlier in the section, is that the cause of the other person's death must be, and then reading short, that person's own deliberate act. And it, in the interest of clarity, I, I think it, 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 it might be better to make provision here that the final act or the final cause uh, was the person's own deliberate act rather than simply to leave the matter uh, as the cause because there may be multiple causes and in an assisted suicide, <coughs> excuse me, will be multiple causes of any person's death because different people are coming together to contribute to that end. So uh, I would suggest that that would be a helpful change to Section 18 that would make matters clearer than they currently are. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you want to come back? I think just on that last point, it would be very helpful to get some written indication of what changes might be appropriate to be able to clarify that area, because it certainly is one that gives me considerable difficulty. Um, and I can see situations in which the relative or friend who's assisting, but they have to then procure drugs from a doctor, for example. The doctor is therefore assisting because they are providing the means by which this is going to occur. So there are multiple assistants involved in this, which I think gives me, you know, certainly as a doctor, gives me uh, some cause for, for concern. Mr. Stevenson. On the practicalities, there, there isn't a, a specified means of uh, committing suicide in, in the Act. Uh, it's not clear exactly what is envisaged as being the means of death. Internationally, there, there, appear, there are people who claim to have developed machines who might, which might be capable of dealing with the situation you envisage where somebody uh, is substantially disabled and, and not uh, physically in a position to ingest drugs there is an Australian doctor who claims to have a machine that will inject lethal drugs on the use of a 
coded password, which someone who is able to move only their eyes uh, can um, uh, trigger uh, by means of computer. So I think there are sort of practical, technical uh, ways around some of the difficulties you've indicated. Thank you. Is, a, is, a, you know, is this a particularly Scottish you know, issue in terms of Scottish law, or are there other jurisdictions across the world who would support assisted suicide of overcome, uh, overcome this problem? Or is there other examples where... For example, um, if you consider uh, the state of Oregon when they introduced their uh, assisted dying bill in 1995, one of the strongest arguments were put forward by uh, lobby groups representing the interests of the, the groups of society that you've described, those with progressive neurological disease or some form of impairment that would make it very difficult for the individual to actually bring about um, their own death. So I don't think it's a situation unique to, to Scots law at all. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to take part in on this section. Are, are, are there any other you know, supplementaries to, the, to, 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 to this theme? Rhoda? Can I, can I just ask for some clarity? Because obviously what we're looking at at the moment is to stop someone... Um, committing a criminal act by assisting someone to commit suicide. Is there a criminal act at the moment, given that suicide itself is not a criminal act? Has anyone been prosecuted for knowing that someone is about to commit suicide and, and kind of maybe doesn't assist because you, you maybe don't assist, but has been aware, maybe has provided moral support or, or whatever, but not actually encouraged or I'm just not awfully sure if that's the case. Um, the last prosecution that, um, that, that took place for um, that type of offence was in 2006. Um, it related to the brother of a man who had Huntington's disease and he was prosecuted um, in relation to his assistance to that man in the High Court, um, was convicted and, and was admonished. So there are prosecutions and have been prosecutions in that area. Not many, but there are prosecutions, and the prosecutions are all for homicide. Okay. And, and although they didn't carry, the person being prosecuted didn't carry out the act that led to the death? It, it, these cases are very fact-sensitive, so it, it would depend uh, under the current law what precise action was taken to assist in the suicide. So whilst uh, the key point, I think, here is perhaps that the... Um, consent isn't a defence in terms of assault or in terms of homicide. So um, any act which is taken to assist in the dying uh, process can be looked at in terms of the law of homicide as a whole. So because you can't consent uh, under the current law to um, die in that way, if someone assists in relation to that, it potentially becomes homicide. But it's difficult to come up with a precise rule because the cases are all very, very fact sensitive depending upon the circumstances of each case and what the condition is and um, what level of understanding the person who dies has uh, and what the intention is of the person who carries out that assistance. Bob, I think you wanted to follow up on some of this and uh, I see Derek as well. Yeah. Um, I, th I, th I was going to read this question anyway, but I think it kind of links in to... Um, when a crime has been committed and um, what, what assistance means. But within the bill, my understanding is that if, if a crime was to be committed or, or the process was not followed, then there are no specific penalties highlighted w within the bill as to what the consequences would be. Would that put a default position under Scots law back to it would be homicide rather than something else? Or should there be provisions within the bill to see what the penalties would be. And I think that probably links in to another matter that was raised in terms of, I mean, no one wants, wants to talk about prosecutions and, and vulnerable cases, and that's not the reason for asking the question. It's to make sure that this is as watertight as, as possible. But also a safeguard within the bill is that anyone who acts out with the processes uh, outlined within the bill who were were not acting, I think, not acting carelessly, 
or acting in good faith, whatever those things would mean, would mean that a savings clause would mean that that wouldn't be prosecutable either. So I'm just wondering where the balance in law sits to when someone, what acting in good faith means or not acting carelessly means within the provision. Is that too broad? So there's no penalties within the bill if the process isn't followed. And there's a savings provision which seems to extend out for when the process isn't followed. And when we're talking about what it means to assist someone to end their life, it, there seems that, that that just compounds the lack of clarity. So uh, I think that links into the line of questionings we've got, and I'd like some opinions on that. To answer the first part of the question first, um, if uh, the default position in terms of this Act were it passed, it would be that if the procedure in the Act isn't followed, then the person assisting would be liable to investigation in terms of the law of homicide. Um, it, it's really a matter for Parliament whether Parliament thinks that other offences could be put within the Act of, of, of not following it, not the law of homicide. Uh, the English Assisted Suicide Bill, for instance, uh, or rather the English Suicide Act of 1961 has specific offences within that and specific penalties which attach to them. Section 24 of the bill um, has the savings provision. That means, um, I, I, as you say, that it, it talks about carelessness and acting in good faith. I, again, there's, I think, a lack of definition round about what that means and what the standard of carelessness is, because the standard of carelessness isn't defined in the Act, so are we looking at that on an objective basis or a subjective basis? Uh, what is acting in good faith? And so... There's a spectrum of potential behaviour here, and as I understand it, the intention behind that particular section of the bill, it is that um, it's to safeguard those who have gone down this process um, and to save them from being liable for prosecution if, if um, some of the paperwork hasn't been filled in correctly, as an example, so as not to expose them for prosecution in terms of the law of homicide. However, the way it's drafted at the moment means that I'm not sure it restricts matters to that situation, which is, I think, what's envisaged. It's, it's, it's not intended to be too technical, but it's, the Act, uh, as proposed, sets out a statutory scheme of checks and balances, and some of those checks and balances, I think, are potentially uh, blunted, would perhaps be a word, but the, the, by the effect of Section 24, which means that it might be difficult to bring a prosecution in other circumstances beyond a mere failure to fill in the paperwork properly, etc. So um, it would restrict the ability to prosecute people in circumstances, I think, beyond a mere technical failure to uh, complete the paperwork properly or uh, to uh, go ahead with the final act at a stage either a day before or a day after the timescale envisaged uh, in the bill, which I, I really think is what the intention that the drafters had behind it, but I don't think that that's necessarily the effect that the provision would have. I've got Colin Kerr, is it on this theme, Colin? Because I would, I would like to get party in to respond to some of this. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. It's actually in, in terms of the... Uh, the final act, I would, I, th I take it we're all agreeing that in the final act, it has to be initiated by the person themselves. Anything else is not really an option in law because then it becomes euthanasia in my eyes. Would that be the way that I'm, I'm, I'm reading that? In which case, moving around, let's assume for the moment nothing else that the final, you know, we're going to a final bill eventually a, a vote and all the rest of it. And we draft up a bill that actually, within the general plan of uh, movement going forward, uh, in terms of what should be provided to initiate such an act, uh, in law at the moment, any, anybody who is helping somebody go through that at this minute is liable for prosecution. Would I be correct in assuming that? So taking that away, and with it, because at this moment I'm a bit woolly as regards how we actually 
get to the point where somebody actually is able to commit suicide in a dignified manner, if there is such a thing. Uh, but to actually, how much of a change really would it be to say that because of the differences in different illnesses and different abilities to um, actually go forward with the act of suicide, the different forms of um, uh, that that suicide might take, is it better that this act is drafted very specifically or kept open in terms of uh, the procurement, the people who are allowed to assist and how they go about it? And I think this is really what the difficulties that you're saying, and this is the difficulty I have in my own mind, is that if we accept that those are the difficulties, does drafting open legislation as against very prescriptive legislation become a hindrance or a help? What we're dealing with here, is, as you've already pointed out, is assistance to end another person's life. And to me, a very simple distinction between euthanasia and assistance in dying is who takes that responsibility. And in this piece of legislation before us, the responsibility for the deliberate act of taking one's own life has to remain with the person. As soon as you move that responsibility onto another person, you're then dealing with euthanasia. And there is nothing in this bill which would allow any interpretation of that whatsoever. Which takes me back to the question itself is how difficult is it to actually put down legislation and is it easier because of the different forms of taking your life is it to keep the legislation open to allow those who are helping to go about it in different ways or and I'm not talking about the, the weeks and time periods and whatever at this time but actually the, the, the more practical methods of help because of the differences, is it better to have more prescriptive or an open piece of legislation? I think that's a matter for Parliament. Um, all I can say there is that other jurisdictions have taken different approaches there. Some jurisdictions focus only on assistance to die. Other jurisdictions focus only on physician-assisted uh, uh, assistance to die. Um, the Netherlands, for example, incorporates both euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. So the end result has been brought about by different means in different jurisdictions. Yes, yes, um, Mr Stevenson and then uh, Mr Riddle, thanks. Um, uh, obviously, the more general, the more open the legislative provisions are, the more risk there is uh, of uncertainty and somebody falling foul of um, the or failing to comply with what would ultimately be the court's interpretation uh, of what the act means and intends. So th there clearly is a tension, I think you, you must be right, between uh, an, an open permissive sort of system and a very heavily regulated system. Where the balance is struck is essentially, I think, a political matter, but the consequences must be that the more flexible the system is, the more open it is to different interpretations and the more uncertain the procedure is and the greater difficulty people will have in knowing that they are protected uh, when they act to assist the bringing about of the end of a life. No. Really, it's just to, to agree um, with, with that point. I think there's challenges at both ends of heavily prescribing, defining and leaving it open. But I do feel because we're dealing with vulnerable people at a very vulnerable stage in, in their life, that my personal view would, would be to err more on, on definition and some, some reassurance there. Otherwise, we are constantly relying on the courts to interpret this, which is not going to get to the position of having a a process and a system which is what, what the bill is seeking to achieve as it stands for example section 18 in its description of assistance talks about no euthanasia etc 
and I think the bill could go further, certainly, than it does at the moment to define what the etc. part is. How would that, what would assistance look like, or, or what, what doesn't that look like? Um, and I think the Assisted Dying Act takes that a little bit further. I don't think it's necessarily the answer, but I think it's an example of where further definition and clarification would benefit all the parties in this. Yes, please, yeah, Professor. A very brief sentence. I think it was um, something that uh, one of the other witnesses had alluded to, that a lack of clarity also perhaps means that there is more invasive investigation at the end of the process. And the aims of the bill are to try and allow some form of autonomy, respect for the individual, value for the individual. So if we're leaving some things to chance or uncertainty, we're then leaving it open for increased investigation, necessary investigation at mm -hmm. the end of that process. It's, just, it's around that the, the very interpretation. If there, if the, if it's open to interpretation, it's possibly open to investigation, and that's the, the thing that needs to be. I think that's Parliament possibly as option to to try and prevent that. Okay. Mike, 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 you 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 wanted to come in at this point, did you? Or? I can come in just now or well, later, I, whatever I, want to get, I mean, uh, if the committee members agree, that I, I want to give um, Patrick Harvey, the member, a, a, an opportunity uh, uh, to, to ask some questions at this point. Patrick. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, thank you for the opportunity as a, as a non-member to, to ask some questions. Um, I'll just uh, mention, as I did to the Justice Committee when they took evidence on the, on the bill, I uh, highlight that I'm very happy to explore constructive amendments that might seek to uh, change the level of detail that's that's on the face of the bill. Uh, it's obviously a matter for members, both of the committee and of the full parliament, to decide on the matter of principle whether to move toward a more codified uh, system. Because in response to the uh, comment from Mr Stevenson that a more open legislative framework does leave people uh, with a lack of clarity about what might be subject to prosecution. Uh, and also the comment from Mr McGowan that we're talking about a, a spectrum or a range of, of behaviours. Uh, I, would, I would put it to you all that the position we're in at present is the most open, undefined legislative framework in this area. An area which is inherently complex and which we're probably never in any legislative context going to have crystal clarity about every theoretical scenario. Can I just mention uh, a paper that's been circulated to, to members from the Office of the uh, Solicitor of the Scottish Parliament outlining the current context, because it's different from the assisted dying bill which amends the Suicide Act. In Scotland, an individual assisting a suicide could be prosecuted under the common law for murder or culpable homicide or some lesser offence such as culpable and reckless conduct. So in, the, in a situation, for example, where someone had uh, taken steps to ensure that someone they were caring for had access to the means to end their own life, available to them within the room they were being cared for, that would be one scenario. In another, where they had physically propped them up in bed during the, the time when they'd taken that action, that would be another scenario. Uh, in another, they might simply have made the practical arrangements for them to travel to Geneva and to end their life in that, uh, in that way. All of these scenarios at present give rise to a great deal of uh, lack of clarity about what offences might be prosecuted and under what circumstances. Uh, isn't it the case that the position we're in at present is the most open and ill-defined legislative framework we could possibly have in this area and that an attempt to outline a process which would be uh, protected from those forms of prosecution uh, is a, a positive step in terms of increasing the clarity available to people. To whoever would like to respond. I think that my hands are tied to some extent in relation to any answer to that question by the ongoing uh, judicial review. I, I, I don't take any... I, I, my hands are tied and I can't really comment upon that, so um, I, I, I'm not sure that there's anything I can usefully add. I think, um, we, we respect your position, but Professor uh, Britton is going to 
Ms Bond. Maybe I can try and help a little there. Uh, clearly, what, what you've said um, has, has some resonance. Um, the view within Scots law in reply to that um, prior to recent events and the current judicial review would be that the law in Scotland is absolutely clear that assisting in the death of another person will incur some form of investigation and possibly some sanction. Um, the position in England, as, as you know, um, was subject to similar consideration and the DPP issued guidelines following um, the case involving Miss Purdy. Um, that position has not yet happened in, in Scotland. So at the moment, we are relying on existing law, which the argument is, is clear. Um, England has tried to be a little bit more specific, but clearly there is a limit to how specific any rules or guidelines can be, because you're then usurping the role, the role of Parliament. So certainly I acknowledge that this may be the time for, for challenge. But, but I would ask, is it clear, in fact, the, the current law in Scotland, is it clear whether someone who had made all of the practical arrangements for someone to travel to Geneva and travelled with them and ensured that they were able to go through that, that process, is it clear that they would be uh, not subject to prosecution? Is it clear that they would be subject to prosecution? I don't think we've had sufficient case law in exactly. Scotland to be able to answer that. Hmm. Does uh, anyone the, else wishes to respond? No. Uh, I, I wonder if I could just follow up with one very brief final point, which is also about the, the line between support and encouragement. I think this was a, an issue which had also been raised in relation to the role of the facilitator, as defined in, in this proposed bill. Um, the, the, the provision of support, practical and emotional support, whether and in what context that might cross the line into encouraging someone to take an action. Isn't this again uh, a situation which exists at present and probably a judgment which would have to be made in any legislative context, whether an assisted suicide bill like this, an assisted dying bill such as uh, south of the border, uh, a, a framework similar to Switzerland, Oregon, Belgium or wherever, uh, that, that judgment would always have to be made about whether support had crossed the line into encouragement. Uh, isn't this simply an aspect which is inherent to this subject rather than one which is specific to this bill? Um, I think the only point I would make there that here in this legislation you're actually authorising somebody to undertake that role. There is a specific appointed person, the licensed facilitator. It's a new role and a very responsible and indeed onerous role. The definitions of what that person can and cannot do have to be clear because I revert back to section one because if they are not then they may be subject to criminal or civil liability. Uh, I think the point that you make that the current position is an uncertain one um, and is therefore an unhappy one is a good point but that in itself does not mean that if you're introducing legislation to create a system that you shouldn't do the best you can to reduce and remove uncertainty. If you criticise the existing system for uncertainty, you should do your best to remove uncertainty if you're creating a legislative regime. Thank you, Kamina. Pursues Lena questioning, yeah. Okay. I might have misled you a wee bit because Dennis, I think, uh, asked me earlier. I've got him on my list, but I'll go, I'll go to Dennis firstly and then I'll come back to you, Mike. Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're looking at some of the aspects um, that you mentioned, and, and I was wondering um, within Section 24, we looked at the, the aspect of, you know, sort of careless aspects. Um, with regard to autonomy, and there's quite a, a lot of emphasis when we're looking at a person, you know, making their decisions for themselves, and that's an autonomous one. But is it fully autonomous, or are people influenced by other people's will? And I'm thinking some of the more vulnerable groups of people, who who they've probably got maybe an idea of themselves on how they want to live their life or end their life at the end of the day, but 
if you're within a vulnerable group, how can that be influenced in a greater part by the will of others? So therefore you're removing the autonomy because it's influenced by the will of others. Yes, please, <laughs> Professor. Um, medical jurisprudence has already acknowledged uh, an individual's right to make decisions involving their health care. Um, and vulnerability and a capacity to make a decision is always going to be a challenging one. I don't think there's ever a completely watertight way to be able to address that. Um, but any capacity under, for example, adults with incapacity law, mental health legislation, looks at the ability of the individual to be able to understand the decision that they are about to make and whether they have the commensurate understanding, knowledge, reason to be able to make that decision. And perhaps that's the best that could be here too. We have a duty if somebody has no capacity or their vulnerability is at such a level that other mechanisms have to be in place to ensure that they are protected and treated equally in society against others. But where there is a possibility of being able to articulate preferences about, for example, healthcare treatment or how we are treated at the end of our lives, I think our ability to articulate that has to be worked out and reasoned and measured against the difficulty of that decision. I think my problem with that is the individual requires to be identified in the first instance. And I think where I'm, um, I'm probably having some degree of, of difficulty here is that I think there are perhaps groups of people within society and perhaps influenced by maybe the different changes within the sort of society influence and whatever that maybe aren't actually known, say, to the medical profession as being particularly vulnerable, but maybe known to maybe other maybe social care services. However, um, so it's not a question of actual capacity, but vulnerability. And I think there are groups within society that are particularly vulnerable and are influenced by whether it be, you know, what, what they read in the media or by family in, encouragement or whatever. Um, and it's, as I say, it's not the capacity that, that's maybe the question, but their um, vulnerability by a, a external influences in, in some respect. And that, and that concerns me. Um, I think one of the areas where the, where the bill might benefit from additional safeguards might be, for example, and I appreciate it's later in the process, but were a person to cancel um, the, the declaration, and again, that's not done in any kind of formalised document like, like the declarations. If, for example, the recording process of the declarations and potentially a cancellation were in a more formalised process, there might be a trigger there where a person could meet with a support service or someone who could discuss the nature of the decision, the reasons behind it. But I think at the moment there is the capacity simply to make the declaration. A very limited number of people would be aware of it and therefore those vulnerable people may in fact be more vulnerable. I think that's my point. I think there are quite a number of groups within society that are you know, on, in, known as vulnerable groups. But the, I think, with, with reference to this, they become even more vulnerable to the influence of other people's um, uh, thoughts uh, and decisions uh, and follow those um, uh, lines of, of decision-making. Um, so therefore, you remove the autonomy, although the person themselves <laughs> may follow that through. They're actually doing so because of the influence of others. I think, I think the yeah. point's been acknowledged in some respect, Dennis, in, in, in terms of, 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 of gaps there. Or, um, but I've got Mike McKenzie. Uh, Mike? Thank you, convener. Um, I know that a lot of the territory we're covering this morning 
has already been covered by the Justice Committee and that Mr Harvey's response, I think, to at least some of the points, if not all of them, was that he was perfectly willing to consider amendments um, which would perhaps seek to deal with some of the points, some of the difficulties that have been raised. And um, given that the law is not a perfect instrument, that it doesn't always function perfectly, um, and uh, I wouldn't suggest for a moment that we don't have a duty to get it to as close to perfection as we can. Um, I wonder if the, may, if, if, if the witnesses feel that if it's possible to deal with some of these concerns by amendments, by statutory guidance, or by subordinate legislation, or do you feel that the bill as it stands is somehow or other um, irredeemably flawed just by the general approach that's been taken? <laughs> uh, that's a pretty straight question. Um, direct. Professor Britton. I don't know if I could comment on all aspects, but if I had to choose areas that I think would need to be firmed up on the face of the bill, uh, it would be around the area of defining the role of the licensed facilitator and, I'm sorry to go back to this, but also defining assistance because we cannot identify criminal or civil liability without knowing what constitutes assistance. I would agree with that, and I would add um, a requirement for clarity round about Section 24 and the, the savings provision and, and what effect that, that actually has. Um, I think I understand its intention. I'm not sure that... I think it goes beyond its intention, the way it's drafted. Mr Stevenson, did you indicate? Uh, yes, I, I did. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the last point about Section 24, which is one of the points I wanted to make. The, the other matter I'd like to pick up on is the need to clarify the role of the facilitator. Um, at, at present, there is no express requirement anywhere in the bill that a facilitator be engaged uh, or that be, he be involved or she be involved to any extent in the process of assisted suicide. Uh, it is necessary for the person applying for assisted suicide to make a statement in their application, a second application, uh, to the effect that they have engaged the, the services of a facilitator, but there is no express requirement on them then to proceed to use the facilitator. The facilitator is given certain duties, is to use best endeavours to do a number of things, including trying to be present at the death, but there is no requirement that the facilitator actually be present at the death. And the facilitator has no powers to force himself upon the person who's seeking assisted suicide. Now, I, I spoke at a symposium on the bill in April last year when a member of the audience suggested that it had been a deliberate policy choice of the uh, late promoter not to specifically require a facilitator, facilitator to be present uh, at the death uh, because a facilitator should not be forced on the individual suicide at the time of the act. It's obviously a deeply personal act. One can understand why that might uh, not be desirable. But if that is correct, and if my reading of the bill is, is correct, then it rather begs the question as to why the facilitator is described in the supporting papers uh, as a safeguard. If he or she is a safeguard, he or she is not a necessary safeguard. Um, yet the only person who has the obligations in relation to, for example, reporting uh, the death or the attempted suicide is the facilitator. Now, if facilitators' involvement is not to be in relation to every attempt, the practicalities of every attempted suicide or suicide, there is then a gap in the reporting provisions. If the facilitator is not there, he doesn't know what's happened, who is to report the suicide or attempted suicide? Uh, and the facilitator is given no powers whatsoever uh, in the bill itself uh, to support their function, to enable them to compel uh, the applicant for assisted suicide to participate in and cooperate with them. Now, there may be very good 
policy reasons for that. It may be decided that uh, that's undesirable uh, or that facilitator shouldn't have to be involved at all stages of the procedure. But if that's the case, and I think it ought to be understood that uh, the facilitator's role is perhaps not as um, all-involving, is not as encompassing as some of the supporting documents for the bill might suggest. Thanks for that. I think I've got um, Rhoda, Rhoda Grant. Um, can Tease out some Certainly further you, you, elucidation you. on the point that I, I was trying to address. And maybe I could rephrase it. Um, uh, you know, are there any, I, I, I accept, absolutely accept, and I think Mr Harvey has accept, that this bill is capable of improvement, perhaps as it goes through Parliament in the terms of amendments. Are there any, and, and, and I'm taking it perhaps, Mr Stevenson, but I'm not absolutely certain, that, that the point that you made there, or any, indeed any of the other points that have been made, are they absolute showstoppers? Or are they um, matters which um, the... Uh, are, are, should not be beyond the wit of Parliament um, in terms of addressing these issues. I think, I think that that's a difficult question to answer because the, it's really a matter for Parliament in terms of how Parliament wants to take that forward. Um, I don't think it's for me to comment upon. All I can comment upon is from my own position, my experience, is to say that if Parliament wants to take forward this particular matter, there are areas here which could be um, fleshed out or, or increased definition uh, could be given to them, and that's, that's what we've been trying to do this morning. I think in terms of your point, I think that's really a matter for Parliament. Does Parliament, uh, uh, as an organisation, want to take, or as a body rather, want to take this forward and, and, and legislate in this area? It's, it's a, yeah, I, I'm very grateful to you for that point, and it's a very interesting point because um, I think the, the tension uh, that you describe um, equally may apply to the functioning of this bill or indeed any piece of legislation in as much as you touched on the possibility of um, lack of perfect clarity, perhaps giving rise to the need to investigate, or sorry, it may have been your colleague, Mr Flanagan. And, and that idea, that, that tension, that possibility, that moral hazard, is that not a, a, a benefit rather than a disbenefit in as much as it exists in all our criminal law, the, the possibility of prosecution if we don't get it right? And is that moral hazard not a good thing, not a bad thing, as it may have been presented earlier on this morning? It, I suggest it's, it's really it's a political issue, isn't it? It's a decision that uh, you and your political colleagues have to take as to what sort of system you want and, and what are to be the consequences. For my part, I'm here representing an organisation. Uh, and you know, it's, whatever personal views I might have, I'm, I'm not able to advance specific suggested amendments to individual clauses in the bill. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I think you misunderstand me again. I'm not suggesting uh, that it's your responsibility or that you ought to suggest amendments. I'm just talking about in terms of the broad principles of the matters you've raised, are they in theory capable of being dealt with uh, by amendment in the parliamentary process or do you think it's you know, irredeemable, the bill as it stands, and, and not capable of... Um, being transformed into a satisfactory state through the normal parliamentary process. So I'm not asking you to write the amendments or, or indeed suggest them. May, may I, I think you've, you, you've tried to elicit a response that you, you, you're not going to get. We are in, at stage one of a parliamentary process and our witnesses are assisting us in identifying problems uh, or, or issues that they, from their expertise, see as a barrier to moving forward. The whole process will be refined at stage two, when we would expect all of those who are interested in the promotion of the bill to take 
into consideration the expert evidence that we've had and the criticism, and, and that will, of course, proceed to a parliamentary debate uh, in the chamber where we will have all of the evidence, the report, subsequent amendments, etc., etc., which indeed may or may not gain the support of Parliament. But we're in the very early stages uh, of, of this round of, of this issue. If we could proceed on, um, uh, 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 Rhoda, Rhoda you, you wish to ask some question, and I think Bob and others want to come back. Yes, um, can I um, ask about investigation? If a, a facilitator needs to tell or, or, or register the death or report the death as a suicide, and they would have obviously the paperwork attached to that, would there be any formal investigation of that? Would that be enough to say that that, is a, that has been carried out under this law and that there requires to be no in investigation as to the circumstances or um, you know, surrounding circumstances of the death? I think that there's an assumption in that question that the facilitator has all of the paperwork and all of the paperwork is in the one place. Um, and so... You're correct to say that the nature of any investigation where this bill passed would depend upon the circumstances, but it's crucial that all the paperwork was available in the same in the correct place so that it could be gone through, and that would be the starting point. It, it may or may not be the end point, but as I understand the bill at the moment, whilst the various declarations and, and various paperwork has to be then uh, noted on the medical records, of uh, the person who's expressing the will to take advantage of the bill. Uh, there isn't a central repository of all of this paperwork, so there's an issue about um, uh, potentially ingathering all of that paperwork. And so that in itself, the way the bill is currently drafted, potentially means that there is an investigation. Uh, and I think, again, the policy intention behind the bill is to minimise um, the intrusiveness of any investigation so that the investigation is there to satisfy the, 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 the authorities can satisfy themselves that things have been done in accordance with the act so um, I, I do think that there's potentially something which could be done about having a central repository the documents um, whereas at the moment it envisages that things will be endorsed in medical records but I'm not sure that the bill is quite as tight as your question suggests I hope that's helpful we support that and uh, in our written submission we uh, suggested something maybe like the Office of the Public Garden, Guardian where documentation when it is collated and I agree that it might not just be a case of producing it, it might take a bit of time so if it is a licensed facilitator they have to be given reasonable time to pull this paperwork together but thereafter, for monitoring purposes, data purposes, security of holding records, something similar to the Office of Public Guardian, where this information can be held centrally and securely. I was going to suggest, as we've uh, made the suggestion previously, that uh, the legislation suggests that the police, the mechanism for reporting would be to the police. And we've previously suggested that uh, in, you know, there's a precedent already where um, for medical deaths which are reported, they're reported directly to the Procurator Fiscal's office and that, that you know, we would, we would wholly support that um, for the consistency. It would make, uh, make things, you know, smoother for everyone concerned. Um, going back, I suppose, to allude slightly to Dennis's question about vulnerable people, if there was somebody who had concerns about that, say a family member who was unaware of the declaration of the intention, and if they took issue with that, if they didn't believe that that was maybe a decision taken by the deceased, what, um, what steps could they take to have that investigated? Be consistent with any concerns anyone had in any uh, other aspects of their life. If they were concerned that there was potentially a criminal act had taken place, they would, you know, they're freely uh, able to report that to the police or to the procurator fiscal, and some an investigation would be, you know, would be conducted. And that's not, uh, I wouldn't imagine that's likely to change if someone has, uh, you know, everyone has a right to express a concern. And so that, that I don't think that anything in the legislation would alter. Uh, alter that uh, ability of people to to report. Does that make sense? So that you know, if someone is to raise a concern, 
then the police uh, or the procurator fiscal would have an interest in what that particular concern was, and if there, if it was necessary, if uh, by uh, if it required more than just uh, you know dialogue, then there would be an investigation is likely to to follow. If there was a concern that all was not as it appeared, perhaps on the face of the paperwork, that would be investigated. That uh, it would have to be investigated. I don't think, in the face of a concern that all was not as it seemed. The paperwork it couldn't be accepted on face value. There would have to be some degree of investigation into that. The extent of that would clearly depend upon the circumstances. But if there's a suggestion that there was no consent and, and or, uh, in some way that there would definitely have to be an investigation into that. But if a family member thought that someone was maybe coerced into making those declarations, the paperwork was properly exercised, registered, if required, um, by amendment in the bill. But if somebody thought that somebody had used their influence over that person to make them reach that decision, made them uh, encourage them to to do the paperwork, um, and you know used that influence where it, where it was quite clear, maybe in front of witnesses, that the person had stated that view, they might have been stating that view in order to kind of get the approval or whatever of the person concerned. That would have to be investigated, and it's potentially something which in terms of the bill at the moment, would, would take the case into an investigation of a homicide rather than uh, something which is dealt with within the parameters of the assisted suicide um, legislation. It would have to be investigated, though, and it would be. Uh, just, it may or may not be the, the right time to ask the, the question of Mr McGowan on the, the issue you mentioned about is, is specific penalties for assisted suicide. Um, would would specific penalties require a specific offence, as it is in England and Wales? Yes, they would, they would, in order for there to be a penalty, there has to be a, a, an offence. So, at the moment, the default position is that if the bill is not, or the, if it became law and it wasn't complied with, the common law would apply. The position in England and Wales is that there are statutory offences round and about this with specific penalties. The the English bill, or the, the bill that's before the UK Parliament, the assisted dying um, legislation, has various um, offences within that about um, fraud and uh, such like, which also have specific penalties. So th those are in um, that legislation. This, uh, if it were passed, the default position is back to the common law. So how do, we, how do you create a specific offence? Parliament would have to define what it was that, that, that it, would need it, to come. Yes. So, it, in terms of the, the UK bill, uh, they look at um, fraud and, and um, fraudulent um, entries in the documents right. and such right. like, and, and yeah. they make that an offence. Okay. Um, Lynette Millen, because she's not been in, and then to Bob. Thank you. Um, We've been talking a lot around the, almost the practicalities of the bill, but the Law Society's written submission actually raises the possibility that to legislate at all in this field um, could be incompatible with the European Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, does the Law Society still have this concern? I think it was to flag up matters of interpretation. Article 2, as you rightly say, confers a right to life. Now, this is interpreted by member states broadly to enforce and protect that right to life. Um, the European Court of Human Rights tends to leave it up to each member state how that has to be interpreted. And a right to life does not automatically confer um, a right to die. However, Article 2 also has to be looked at in relation to Article 8, a right to a private life, and there's been far more case law ar around that. So you can take some English cases in, in involving Miss Pretty and Miss Purdy, and the issue of the private life is whether or not one can make decisions about one's death and the processes leading up to that, is that an integral part of life? And Lord Hope and Purdy acknowledged that it was, so that gives the individual. So Article 2 is a right to life, which will not, under current interpretation, confer a right to die. But within the confines of this bill, 
we're not actually looking for a personal right to die. What's been proposed in this bill is that under certain circumstances that assistance be provided. Has this issue arisen with other jurisdictions who are signatories to the HCR, um, you know, who also have laws that allow um, assisted suicide? The case law is only starting to be developed in more recent years. Um, many of the states were relying on a common law development within their own member state. And to say the European Court sort of talks about a margin of appreciation which has to be applied in each and every circumstance. So they are really reluctant to interfere in what a right to life might mean. So, for example, um, a right to life might include evaluations of personhood. When does life begin? And each and every, every, every member state will have religious influences, cultural influences and legal influences which would determine that. So... The jurisprudence in terms of case law has been developing, particularly in recent years. So some of it will have had some impact, but it is having increasing impact, and we are looking to the European Court of Human Rights. But more so, um, Article 8, this notion of a right to a private life and what that actually means um, in terms of our decision-making about death and the dying process. And, and has, have these issues been taken into consideration in south of the border in the legislation currently before the House of Lords? I would imagine that they have, yes. Um, particularly with such recent case law, I mean, you, as well as Miss Purdy, Miss Pretty, uh, the Supreme Court um, issued uh, the judgment in the case of Mr Tony Nicholson and others just last year. Um, I would find it um, very surprising that that was not to the fore um, in Lord Falconer's bill and any deliberations there. And the Supreme Court made it very clear that any decision taken as to whether assisted suicide um, was to be endorsed was strictly a matter for Parliament and not for the courts to decide at that time. I can ask if anyone else has any comments on, on these issues. Good summary, Professor Britton. Um, I have uh, Bob Doris and uh, Patrick. You, do, you, do you wish to ask some additional questions? You, I'll, I'll take you. I've got some. I've got other hands now. They were always quiet, so I've got Bob Doris, um, Richard Simpson, Colin Keir, and uh, if, if, if you want, Patrick, come back on. I had a few things I wanted to ask. I'll, 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 I'll try and be as concise as I can as, as I go through them. We, we had some discussion about um, what it means to, to assist um, uh, in relation to, to, to assisted suicide. And, and I'm interested in the roles of medical professionals in, in relation to this, because before people can, can exercise their right, if that's what's decided, if that's what's passed by, by this place, you have to know about it. So, for example, the place you may find out about it may be your, your GP for example. Now, GPs may have a variety of views on that. They're, in, they're individuals in their own right, plus they've got their own, their, their, their own regulatory system. Um, it's what the balance between a GP informing a, a patient's unsolicited that this is a, a treatment option. Would it be seen as a treatment option? Uh, would that be a valid thing to do? Could that be interpreted as uh, promoting or encouraging the practice and how would that be defined within this bill or indeed within within law? And I don't want to be frustrated for the member promoting this bill, but, but I think as members we do have to think about potential scenarios should this bill be be successfully passed. So there may be a scenario where, where the family disagree with the exercise right in relation to uh, assisted suicide and, and may challenge on a variety of fronts, one of which may be the advice or the information that was given by a medical professional or anyone else. I'm just wondering where the protections sit within this, this bill in relation to that. <laughs> well, can I, before, uh, <laughs> Professor Britton seems to mop up all the, all, all, all the, all the curveball questions here. But if, if it hasn't, I mean, I can twist this and twist it, so I can be slightly tangential with it and say, if it's not something you've given consideration to, maybe it's not relevant, but perhaps it's very relevant and it hasn't been given consideration to. So 
Can I ask you if you have given consideration to it? And if you haven't, that's allowed. But do you think it's something that does have to be fleshed out and consideration does have to be given to? Yes, Mr. Riddle uh, and, and Mr. Stevenson. Um, it is not something that I've given direct consideration to in relation to the medical profession, but it's certainly something that, from a legal standpoint, we have considered in terms of, from a solicitor's point of view, for example, you might give a client advice about different options, testamentary, executories. Would this therefore be something that you'd need to consider? And I think particularly from a solicitor who has professional obligations around integrity, honesty and a client's best interest, I think that leaves huge ethical challenges for a solicitor as, as to what they might do. And I think there is a risk there about at what point do you say that assistance or encouragement does sort of seep beyond the immediate parties um, to the, that the legislation envisages. What I don't know is, is the answer in terms of what, what that would mean. You couldn't compel a solicitor, and I assume you couldn't compel a medical practitioner to, to, to you know, um, disseminate this information or promote it or, or however you define it. But I think it is a difficulty um, with this particular legislation. Uh, if the bill were passed, then there would be a law in Scotland making assisted suicide legal in certain circumstances. It's therefore very difficult to see how someone who is simply imparting information about a legal regime which exists uh, could be, in doing that, contravening some other law. If you're simply telling somebody this is a system, it's approved by the Scottish Parliament, it, it exists. From the point of view of a doctor promoting this, a doctor would have to consider their ethical position uh, in addition to their legal position. And their ethical position would be largely as determined by any guidelines issued by the General Medical Council. Uh, and at present, the General Medical Council's face is set against uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia. Uh, assisted dying. If uh, a legal regime were introduced, then the GMC might have to look at that again. Clearly, I'm not in a position to speak for the GMC. But I think the doctor's role would be one that would be subject to professional regulation by uh, the doctor's professional bodies, and in particular, uh, the body that defines doctor's ethical obligations in the form of the GMC. Okay. I think that that's helpful. I should, can we just say on, on a personal level, I, I wasn't suggesting that doctors should encourage or promote or, or, or a pathway towards assisted suicide. I'm just trying to look to see where challenges could come. And I think that's maybe a question for the next panel, a bit, a bit more relevant for, for them as well, what was looking at the legal position. Just on that, but I, mean, yeah. I presume that the, the GPs, the doctors, would be subject to the same concerns that you... Uh, you, you, you you warned of earlier about the lack of clarity uh, uh, in terms of the bill in its current forum. That would apply to anyone, doctors, friends, family, whatever, who were assisting in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in dying. With the pre present concerns that you've outlaid, doctors would fall into that category as well. Yeah. It would be applied equally yes. to any member in society. Mr. Stevens. It does seem to be envisaged by the bill that uh, this be a service supplied uh, under the auspices of the NHS. It doesn't say that in terms, but it, it, it talks about registration and uh, the, the, the keeping of documents in the patient's medical records, the use of registered medical practitioners. Supporting documents, I think, is in, uh, anticipate um, that the system would work within the NHS. Therefore, if that's to be regarded as an NHS service, doctors who work in the NHS might be concerned that they should have some specific protection or opt-out. Now, I know you're hearing later today from uh, Dr Potts, and he deals with this very nicely in his submission, which is appended to the documents you have. And he says, well, if participation is considered part of NHS duties, there's a strong case for an opt-out provision so that a doctor knows that they are not uh, considered by their NHS employer to be obliged to participate if, for conscience reasons, they don't feel able to do so. Uh, and therefore, it may be that one of the matters that should be considered is a conscience clause. 
uh, and faculty has referred to this in their submission. I think just, just to develop that slightly further, absolutely, I think there, there could be an, uh, there, there's significant uh, ethical and practical judgment calls that I suspect uh, the medical profession would have to make. For instance, if, 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 their, if their patient is unaware of assisted suicide and they deem them to uh, uh, qualify in terms of, in theory, being able to go down this pathway about when it would be appropriate to inform the, the, their patient of that and would that be deemed to, to encourage and it's a very difficult issue to, to tease out what is or isn't appropriate and how that how that could the checks and balances could be uh, provided within that without um, you know uh, maybe compromising doctor patient confidentiality there but there are two other kind of medical areas that I was hoping to, to explore and understand and I may have got this wrong but in terms of determining whether an individual has capacity uh, and under a, this bill in a previous forum, uh, there would be reference to a psychiatric assessment, which doesn't necessarily have to take place in, on, in this occasion. And also, um, I'll try and roll this together, for hopefully for brevity, in terms of um, also qualifies, have to have capacity, but also has to be a terminal illness or a life-limiting one. And the fact that there could be various medical opinions in relation to that. Um, so I'm thinking about after the event in itself. If, for instance, um, assisted, an individual assisted suicide case is challenged uh, because they, an individual believed the person making the decision didn't have capacity, but there wasn't a full psychiatric assessment done, or they challenged it on medical grounds that they didn't believe that the patient's condition allowed them to qualify, um, where, where's the legal position in relation to that? And are the checks and balances right within the bill? Are the protections right within the bill? I think from the moment full circle, it's about the, the clarity, again, in, in relation to this. I'm just trying to tease some of that out with some very specific examples. Yes, Professor Brunton. Can I take, I think, the last point that you were referring to in terms of uh, definitions of terminally ill and life-shortening? It's something that any piece of legislation that I, I know of has, has struggled with. How do you encapsulate um, what somebody's illness or what stage it has to be at to be able to fall within the provisions of any law? And here we are relying on medical diagnosis, clearly in first consultation, second consultation. As part of the process, it is medical diagnosis. We believe, the Law Society believes, that it shouldn't only be reliant on medical diagnosis. If this is about an individual's autonomy to be requesting assistance at the end of their life, their own subjective view, we believe, should play a part in this as well. The quality of their life, in their opinion, and not just on medical opinion, the value of things that might be important to them in the end stages of their life should play a part. And if that was the case, that it's medical diagnosis, good communication, we believe, between doctor and patient, that should always be encouraged, and a respect for each party's viewpoint, then we would hope that that would go some way to painting a fuller picture, medical diagnosis linked with person's value system, belief, and their views on their own quality of life at that time. Uh, the approach taken in sections 8 and 10 is to uh, start with medical diagnosis, but then to say it is necessary for the applicant to have reflected on the consequences uh, of the medical condition and have concluded that the quality of their life is unacceptable. So is unacceptable suggests currently unacceptable. And also, it would seem the person must see no prospect of any, any improvement in the quality of their life. So, no prospect and any improvement. So, there is quite a high hurdle added to the fact of medical diagnosis of a life-shortening or terminal condition that may be life-shortening but still leave you with decades to live. So, you must have... Uh, to qualify under the bill, a perception that your current uh, life quality is unacceptable. 
and that there is no prospect of any improvement. Quite high hurdle, I think, and a subjective one. Thanks for that. You just need to add capacity. I'm just wondering can about what the, 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 the definitions, the life shortening. And so, but yeah, yeah, yeah supplementary. Back to you, Bob, with Bob has actually asked the two questions that I was going to ask, so I'd like to do supplementaries on both, if I may. On, on this first one, if you take someone, for example, let's to take a, an ex, a rather extreme example, but someone with schizophrenia, the number of people with schizophrenia who commit suicide is huge. It's really very significant. They see no prospect of their life improving during periods of control or, you know, uh, where they, their symptoms are diminished. Um, they, they may actually, in those better states, become aware that their long-term prospects of actually managing this with the medicines that they're required to take, etc., there is no prospect. Are people like that going to qualify under the Act? There are, there, is, there are also those, for example, with learning disability, not severe learning disability, but significant learning disability, or with epilepsy. All these people at the moment tend to have a much shorter life expectancy. So I have real difficulties, not about the terminal illness group, not about the progressive group, but I have significant difficulties, and I would like commentary from the witnesses, on those, you know, what, what constitutes life-shortening, a life-shortening condition. It's not defined. It would seem, therefore, to follow that any illness which shortens your expectancy of life is life-shortening. And in the faculty's submission, we pointed out that there will be very many everyday type conditions which are likely to be life-shortening. Uh, type 2 diabetes may shorten your life. It may shorten your life only by a relatively short period of time. But nonetheless, you could argue that it's a life-shortening condition. 50, 15 years in the BMJ yeah. last week. Uh, I think it was 15 years. So, you know, so we have a problem. The other thing is no prospect of improvement. I mean, a recent case that really disturbed me was the young man who'd had a rugby injury and was uh, paraplegic as a result and went to, 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 to Switzerland. Now, you know, the situation around him was that exoskeletons providing movement are being developed as we speak, that uh, spinal transplant of stem cells are being developed as we speak. You know, so no prospect of improvement seems to me to be, again, a clause what constitutes that? You know, who decides that there's no prospect of improvement? Who decides that this, you know, that the course of action of assisting someone who decides they have no prospect, when actually there is a prospect out there of improvement, who's decided there is or no, no prospect of improvement? Um, so, Stevenson. Sorry. I think the case you're referring to is the case of David James, the, the, the uh, very young young man. I think that perhaps his case provides a good example that there has to be more than just a medical diagnosis and perhaps provides an example of looking at the broader picture there. Um, Mr James tried to take his own life um, once by overdose and once by trying to stab himself to death. Uh, I believe that family members had done everything they possibly could to try and encourage a quality of life there and his family reached a view I'm sure very reluctantly at the end of the day that this was what Mr James wanted at that time I don't think we've any way of knowing whether that's something he would have wanted in the future had he lived but his quality of life at that time gave rise to his family and family friends being willing to offer support to allow this man to end his own life. A natural reaction. Richard, it was a supplementary. Mr. Yeah. Simpson went back in, and I've got two or three, and we're under pressure, I think, in time. You asked uh, whose choice is it, or whose decision is it, that uh, a quality of life is unacceptable. Well, in the first instance, it's the person who applies in terms of the bill, and you find that sections 8 and 10 then the medical practitioners have to be satisfied that the facts they have available to them are not inconsistent, you note the double negative, uh, with the conclusion of the individual as to the 
unacceptable quality of their life. So it's not clear to me what degree of scrutiny is required because this is a conclusion the medical practitioner requires to make on the information he has. Um, what information will he have in individual circumstances, I suspect, will vary. But it doesn't seem to involve an objective review of the patient's subjective conclusion that his life is unacceptable. Uh, it may be that that would not be possible or realistic. It may be that it would be said that that shouldn't be an aim of the bill. But that seems to be what's anticipated at present. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I've, I've, I've got Bob who want to uh, conclude, uh, but Richard Lyle hasn't been in, and I want to give Patrick the opportunity to uh, get back in, and we're going to do that within the next 15 minutes. Yeah, it really was just in terms of it, I'd asked about, about capacity. I think that's fleshed out some of the, the issues in relation to subjective views of the individual, perhaps overriding medical consideration, and that's a, that's a political judgment call, an ethical judgment call, as much as it is a legal issue, but in terms of capacity, um, that, that would be maybe more clearly a legal issue as well as a medical one. If, if, if a person has, has, has not been, been, ha, been had a psychiatric uh, review, uh, and maybe a medical professional doesn't deem that to be appropriate, but there's a lot of undiagnosed psychiatric conditions uh, within society that could go undetected, and the previous bill seemed to give provision that that should happen. Could it be legally challengeable um, on the basis that the the medical professional got that wrong or should have on balance uh, re referred it for a psychiatric review. Open for, for challenge and I mean, capacity is a, a concern in the in law society submissions to the degree that there are different degrees of capacity required for different, different decisions. So, and, and I won't labour it, but there's a particular view the Law Society have around solicitors acting as proxy because this is, in our view, a significant decision. And it has you have to be sure that the person has capacity commensurate with the significance of this decision. So certainly from the perspective of a solicitor taking the role of proxy, I suspect a solicitor would look for some form of psychiatric or medical reassurance and, and, and confidence that the person understood the effect of that decision. And it... it it very much does differ in our view, a solicitor potentially or, or, or determining whether someone has capacity, say, to transact in the purchase of a property or, or a basic contract versus do they have capacity to understand the decision they're making, the consequences of it, whether they could in fact change their mind, whether they could cancel it. There's lot, lots of the areas there and it does pick up on Dr Simpson's original point about impaired cognizance as well. How do you determine whether capacity um, continues, whether it was, it was valid perhaps at one point in time but, has, but hasn't differed? So yes, I, I think there's a difficulty in, in, in ensuring there's capacity, but I think because of the significance of, of the effect of this legislation, it really has to be a very high test. Thank you. Mr. Stevenson, and I think um, Mr. Flanagan, which is the, did you wish? No, I'm oh, sorry. But, um, um, Mr. Stevenson. The uh, endorsing medical practitioners in respect of both the first and second request need to, um, uh, uh, need to be satisfied that the person, in their opinion, that the person making the request has a capacity within meaning of Section 12. Section 12 introduces a two stage approach to testing capacity. The first stage is by reference to the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. The section says, subsection says that a person has capacity to make a request if he's not suffering from any mental disorder within the meaning of the Act, which might affect the making of the request. Now, um, mental disorder in terms of the section is any mental illness personality disorder or learning disability, however caused or manifested. So if somebody has, let's take mental illness, a mental illness uh, that might affect the making of the request, the first, first of the two stages in the test of capacity, they would fail. What uh, the faculty is concerned about is that this part of the 
test of capacity involves a medical decision which looks like a psychiatric decision, unless somebody already has a diagnosis of a mental illness when perhaps a GP or a consultant um, dealing with a cancer patient might know that they have a mental disorder. So it does suggest a psychiatric diagnosis. Who is capable of making a psychiatric diagnosis? A psychiatrist is, is another medical practitioner. Uh, so we're concerned that the practical effect of this might be to require a psychiatric diagnosis at the first part of the two-stage test. Uh, but if your medical practitioner has to be a psychiatrist, uh, is he capable of making the diagnosis of the terminal or the life-threatening, uh, life-shortening condition? I'll leave that with you. What does it mean to say which might affect the making of the request? Now, I know uh, uh, Mr. Harvey has a different view uh, to me on this, but might affect, well, might suggests a mere possibility is enough. What does affect the making of the request mean? Does it mean influence the making of the decision behind the making of the request? It, it, it's, to my mind, not a very clearly expressed provision and might be improved on. The second part of the test relates to capability in more of a practical sense, ability to make a decision, remember a decision, etc. And that may not be a medical expert psychiatric decision. You have psychiatrists who've responded, you know, you've got a copy of their paper, say that's not. But I think the first stage is a psychiatric decision. Explore that later, I think. Um, Richard Lyle. Right, uh, Harvey, and then we're going to bring it to a close. Thank you, Dina. I've sat and listened this morning to and most, and most of the questions were um, um, points that I was, I was going to raise, but I, I think I have to raise one, and what's coming across to me, Parliament makes laws, uh, police um, implement them, procurator fiscal charges people, lawyers defend people in court or not, and, and, and look at all the, the things. But basically what has been said today is, to cover all the bases, this bill is going to run into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amendments. My point, and this is what I want to ask you, people have the right to live. We all agree that. But do people not also have the right to die when they choose to die? I think that's essentially a matter for Parliament. That goes to the, goes to the, le the legislative purpose of this um, bill and really not something that I can certainly comment upon. Um, but, but, you know, with great respect, earlier on you said that, you, you know, it's homicide, that, you know, it's not suicide, you know. Basically, I don't want to go over what all that you said this morning, but at the end of the day, if, if, people want to, if people want to die, you know, why should we, why should we, we not respect that? That's the question I want to an answer. Talk about the law of homicide. The law of homicide currently applies to this situation to anyone who assists someone else. So that's the current law. If Parliament wants that not to be the, the, the situation, then Parliament can legislate to that effect. But that's really a matter of, of, of for Parliament. Mr Stevenson. Uh, the, the, the dead are beyond the reach of the law. If somebody commits suicide, uh, then in this life their troubles are over. They will not be prosecuted. They're dead. The point of this act is to protect those they leave behind and who may have been complicit in their act of suicide and to pre pre prevent them from being prosecuted or being found civilly liable because our focus has been very much on the criminal side of things but there's also a removal of civil liability in section two of the act. So uh, I think the focus isn't so much on somebody's right to die or kill themselves if they choose, it's to protect those they've left behind. I, I, I would agree with that. If it's 
not so much the autonomy or the personal decision to die, but the fact that this legislation requires the assistance of a number of different professionals to bring that about. Professionals such as doctors, solicitors and the new role of a facilitator, many of those already have professional codes of conduct and obligations which haven't really been accounted for necessarily within the process set out in the bill. And I think that's really why the, the professionals are, are keen to safeguard and highlight those, those, those conflicts. The, the bill doesn't propose a right to die. We need a right to die. <laughs> we are all going to die. What we are looking for here is under certain conditions that that help is provided. Just come back, Kavina. You know, none of us want to lose any of, our, any of our loved ones. You know, at the end of the day, we've all went through that pain at some time with, uh, 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 you know, grandfathers, mothers, daughters, you know, whatever. You know, but at the end of the day, as I say, yes, and, and you know, Mr. Stevens was correct. You know, but I, what I'm saying is, you know, if you you want to, all the points you made this morning, we would need hundreds and hundreds of amendments in to cover the the person who is left, who knows that their loved one has wanted to go. That's the point I'm trying to make. We hope. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Patrick Harvey, please. Thank you very much, convener. And on that last point, I, I would just observe, I, I don't think I've ever seen a bill introduced to Parliament which wasn't capable of improvement uh, through the amendment process to some extent. And uh, as I say, I'll, I'll be happy to engage with any proposed amendments which are constructive and intended to improve the bill during the process. I actually agree strongly with some of the, the comments made there about the, the purpose uh, and the, the, the intention of the bill. Uh, so I'll, I'll not go over that again. And I'll also leave the issues around psychiatric assessment and so on to the next panel, which, where I think they might be more usefully uh, explored. Um, I think there were just two issues that I wanted to, to pick up on, which came uh, came up more recently. One is on the, the issue of a conscience clause or an opt-out uh, clause. Given that the regulation of uh, the professions is currently a reserved function, uh, it seems possible that that could be implemented either through guidance or perhaps through uh, ministerial regulations. Uh, can I ask the, the witnesses who raised that whether those are appropriate means uh, of introducing uh, a, a, a degree of protection for those who don't wish to participate, who want to be sure that they will not be required to participate uh, in assisted suicide? Uh, and uh, if, if those are not adequate means, uh, is it possible for the bill to address this by another means? Um, I, I think I, I, I raised the conscience clause. From my point of view, it doesn't matter much where the provision is to be found uh, as long as it is there and it is e effective. And it gives those uh, who have conscientious objection to participation uh, in the process an ability to opt out. And as I I've, have said on uh, another occasion, it also seems to me it would be appropriate and necessary to include in the conscience clause a requirement that if somebody is declining involvement on grounds of conscience, then they should be under a duty to advise the uh, person seeking assisted suicide of that fact so they know that is why they are being refused assistance and have the option to go to somebody else who may be prepared to supply them with the assistance they are seeking. So it's not enough for somebody to say I'm not being involved and leave somebody with the impression that they somehow don't qualify when they do or might. Thank you. Uh, I, I think whether people agree or disagree with the basic principle at stake, I don't think I've met anybody who's discussed this issue who wouldn't welcome a clear conscience clause. Apart from anything else, it would give individuals the, the ability to ensure that they had registered with a GP who agreed or disagreed uh, with this issue in principle and know that they were be, going to be given treatment by someone with uh, a, a view that was compatible with their own. Um, you, you discussed some of the issues around qualifying conditions. And I think in, in looking at what seemed to me a, a fairly extensive list of, of conditions, which in, in my view would be unlikely to uh, to qualify, you actually uh, added the possibility of type 2 diabetes. Uh, can I just suggest to you that 
although it, it might uh, be described as a uh, life-shortening condition and thereby uh, meet the, the test of Section 85A, it certainly wouldn't, in the absence of other uh, factors, uh, it wouldn't meet the, the in itself meet the, 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 the whole test of the, of the bill, which you described as, as a high bar. Uh, type 2 di diabetes in its own right wouldn't, uh, wouldn't meet that, that high bar, would it? It's, it's difficult to envisage somebody concluding that the quality of their life was unacceptable uh, and that there was no prospect of any improvement simply because they had type 2 diabetes. That, that's why I was trying to perhaps not successfully get across the, the fact that there does have to be an objective medical diagnosis, but there then has to be a subjective impact on the person's life. And it's at that point where it seems to me the bar is set quite high because they have to conclude on reflecting on their condition that they have an unacceptable quality of life with no prospect of any improvement. So, uh, and so they, they would have to be some relation because that's as a consequence of reflecting on the condition. So uh, existential angst in, indeed, and, and the, the zone is medical practitioners who, who then uh, endorse the, the, the individual's request would have to be satisfied uh, that the, uh, the person's quality of life, that the person's conclusion about their quality of life is not inconsistent with the facts known to the practitioner. So there's, there's that, that double level of, of there, this. There is a check, whether yes. you feel that that check is strong enough and the, the use of the double negative is appropriate, yeah. or whether the should be some additional requirement of uh, investigation. I don't mean an extensive investigation, or, or inquiry, okay. uh, rather than leaving the medical practitioner's decision based on such material as they currently have, which could be not very much. Okay, that's, that's helpful, thank you. And, and again, that, that level of detail is something that I'm, I'm very happy to explore. F finally, and I, th I think this was clear in the, in the question earlier uh, around compatibility with ECHR, could I just uh, clarify what was, what was being said there? It does seem clear at present that, as with other issues that the Scottish Parliament has legislated on recently, such as uh, same-sex marriage, it's clear that ECHR neither compels a jurisdiction to provide this nor forbids a jurisdiction from providing this. Th that is the case in relation to uh, assisted suicide, whether we look at the, the decisions that are being reached at European level or in the Supreme Court within this country. Under the interpretation of Article 2, yes, it does not confer um, a right to die and the European Court of Human Rights is keen to allow that margin of appreciation to be given to each member state. But I don't think Article 2 can be read on its own. It has to be read in conjunction um, with other articles, primarily uh, Article 8 there. And the, the decision of the Supreme Court, as far as I understand it, uh, makes it clear that the question of whether Article 8 uh, uh, has been breached is a, is a question for domestic courts. It's issue of proportionality yeah. in domestic courts. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Kavina. Thank you. And can I thank you all who have attended the panel today. Um, on behalf of the committee, thank you. We're very grateful for your written evidence and uh, your precious and valuable time that you've given here uh, this morning. Thank you all. And we come to an end of this session um, and pause to set up the, the next panel. Thank you. Thank you again.
Can we now reconvene uh, and continue agenda item number four, uh, our stage one scrutiny of the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. Uh, our second panel this morning um, is Dr Francis Dunn, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, uh, and Dr Stephen Potts, consultant for psychiatrists, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland, and Aileen Bryson, Practice and Policy Lead Royal Pharmaceutical Society in Scotland. Welcome to you all. We're going to go directly to Bob Doris for our first question. I'll take bids from the committee. I see. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Uh, I think towards the end of our last evidence session, we were teasing out some of the, the potential uh, issues or challenges for the medical profession should this bill be, be passed into statute and become law. One of them was in relation to uh, whether there should be a a conscience clause on the face of the bill, whether um, it would be acceptable to have something at a later date in guidance or in secondary legislation, and whether existing um, uh, codes in relation to medical practice provides suitable protection for medical professionals, be it GPs at the local practice or others who may be at some point involved in, in, in the assisted suicide pathway. That's the correct terminology, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But also just to tease it out further, convener, I think some of my questioning earlier on was about at what stage it would be appropriate for a medical professional to, if you like, awareness raise with one of their, their, their patients that perhaps assisted suicide is something they should be aware of. Because I would imagine by saying to someone, this is something you should be aware of, could be tacitly also moving towards saying this is something you should consider. And I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to tease out whether you feel, as the bill stands just now, that's something you think medical professionals would feel comfortable with and that they would have suitable protections for their own individual views as well as do, do, doing, do, 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 working in the best interest for their, their, their patients. Um, I'll answer that as a psychiatrist representing psychiatrists in Scotland. Um, I think it would be a very unusual position for a psychiatrist to suggest or advocate the possibility of suicide to any of the patients we were seeing. But we wouldn't expect to, see, to be the clinicians in the front line who might raise that question. I would defer to the views of my colleagues about that. I obviously at the Royal College represent a huge uh, constituency with, with varying views about this and, and a, I would say that the majority of, of, of view really is the, of this trust relationship between doctor and patient and, and the, the, this is a, a new concept and to many doctors an alien concept of actually having an option of discussing uh, assisted suicide with the patient. So it would be very important I think if this were to proceed to have a conscience clause, one would be concerned about uh, the patient having to go to different doctors to find one that, 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 that was in agreement with that. So I think we need to think of the, our, our duty of care to the patient from that point of view. But I think the conscience clause is very important and I think it's important to emphasise that, 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 that there are diverse views within the profession. But within my organisation, the majority view is very much uh, that it... it, it kind of impinges on that trust relationship between doctor and patient. Can I start from the perspective of pharmacists also? We would uh, really like a conscious clause to be in the statute rather than in professional guidance. And uh, we also represent members who have very wide views on this. But among the, the members who would be willing to dispense a prescription for this procedure if the legislation came through, then a conscience clause was an absolute must in, that, in those circumstances to protect okay. them. And can I say, convener, I, 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 I do know that, that there are a variety of, of professionals who, who, who may seek the assurance or comfort of, of, of a conscience clause. I, I mentioned doctors in the front line and, and, and GPs practice as a potential first point of contact for, for, for patients, and that, that's why I started off with that. An interesting thing in relation to the, 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 the trust dynamic um, with, with, with patients, I'm just wondering if it's still the case that there's, there's many family members have the, the same GP or the same GP's practice and that where maybe the individual is seeking to go down a road where family members may or may not disagree, may or may not agree with whether there's a trust issue not just with the individual but actually the wider 
the wider, the wider family network. Because I know things have moved on a lot, where people move their GP's practices a lot more, but it used to be families traditionally had the family doctor and the GP's practice, and if, if that, that, that that's a, a, could have a bearing on it at all. Okay, well, I was just going to say that the, the, the relationship between the patient and the doctor is the prime relationship, and the, 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 you know, I think nowadays we take a much uh, more positive view from this point of view. In days gone by, you actually excluded the patient sometimes from discussions about their prognosis and their outcome because they thought that would affect the patients. But thankfully, these days are gone now, so it's very, very important that that relationship should be one. Clearly, there is involvement of the family as the patient dictates, but I think it's very important important that the patient is the one that dictates how much involvement they want their family to have with the general practitioner. So I suppose, sorry Mr Potts, Dr Potts, apologies. Yeah. Did you want to come in there? Um, There's a supplementary point about conscience clause uh, insofar as it affects psychiatrists. Um, I represented the college in responding to the, the previous bill in 2010 and surveyed the uh, subspecialities in psychiatry that might wish to avail themselves of an opt-out or conscious, conscience clause. It was important to do so then because that bill built in many uh, requirements or duties upon psychiatrists and two-thirds of the psychiatrists responding would wish to opt out of all or some of the provisions in that bill. Now I suspect that uh, if this bill is passed, a proportion of psychiatrists will also want to opt out. Um, it probably won't be as high as two-thirds, but it may well be substantial and it could be a majority. We would need to poll again to know that. I suppose the only other thing I would ask in relation to the con conscience clause then, I think there seems to be a kind of a unity of views from, from, from this particular set of witnesses, and that would be um, pharmacists, was mentioned, and psychiatrists, um, GPs. Are there other professionals in, 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 in the field and front line that, that, that you think would, would potentially come under the scope of any co conscience clause to, to, get, to give the, the, the committee a, a kind of flavour of the extent of, of, of that? Um, if the person seeking assisted suicide is in a palliative care residential placement or on a hospital ward, then the nursing staff attending to them may wish to avail themselves of a conscience clause if they're expected to nurse somebody who's um, uh, requesting assisted suicide. So if it's in an institutional setting with nurses involved, they might ask why they're not able to avail themselves of a conscience clause when pharmacists and doctors and psychiatrists and GPs are. Um, and um, there may not be any others, uh, if Ms Bryson has others to wish to put on record. No, I think that, that, that covers it. I think it's off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, and, and Mr. One, one final thing, and I'll, I will leave it at this, convener, and, and Mr Harvey Patrick will, of course, um, clarify this himself, but I did write something down uh, when Patrick was giving, sorry, Mr Harvey was giving, uh, uh, asking a question in relation to people may wish to um, register with a GP who either supports or doesn't uh, support assisted suicide. Uh, that may be taken out of context, and I'm sure that will be clarified later, but I was concerned about that because I, I would like to think that wasn't the overriding reason why someone would choose a, a, a GP or a particular health practice when they're building up a relationship and a variety of, 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 of health needs. But... Would you have concern if that became a, a pattern of registration with, with people who are registering with GPs, depending on what their own ethical issues may be in relation to something like this? Um, none of us here represent GPs and would hesitate to speak for them. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm, I'm not in a position to make a view on that as a psychiatrist. Okay. Um, I think this would this this could come in as an issue. It's very difficult to know how much of an issue it would be. Often, you know, as you mentioned, families are registered with a GP from very early life, and it would obviously not be an issue for many of them that they would really want want to raise. But, you know, if this bill came into practice, we, you know, I think it could it could be an issue for some individuals at, at the time of registering with the GP. Thank you. You've spoke about the, the, the existing relationship between and trust between a patient and doctor uh, at that point, and you seem to be indicating that um, the assisted suicide bill would be likely to uh, alter that relationship. And what, 
in what way would the, the, that relationship be be altered if you, uh, if, if as a, a medical profession, you you have a discussion with that patient that that brings this subject up? And would it be described as you know a, you know a therapeutic approach or a medical approach? Or you know, do you, what, what way does it change? What, what is the fear in terms of? Uh, trust in the relationship? What is the concern? I think the, you know, as this, as I say, this additional dimension to it, doctors um, are absolutely committed to ensure the best of health for their patients and when it comes to the time of dying that they have a, a death that is, is, is peaceful and dignified. Um, but up until now, the great majority of doctors are would be uncomfortable about participating in a process which directly um, led to the patient's death. That's something that's not, that is alien to our development and career. Um, having said that, there's also a feeling that if that was an option, that this would reduce other options such as further development of the palliative care movement. You know, I, I feel that if this had come in, say, 20 years ago, it would have diminished the impetus on the palliative care movement. And there are still many further developments that we can make in palliative care, particularly in non-malignant conditions. Uh, and I think that if this was an option on the table, then the, the, the other options would not be able to be explored in the same way. So I think that's a real issue. <clears throat> and the other point is that we've heard already today about the developments that are being made in situations like quadriplegia, which were before reckoned to be something that was really incurable. And even 70 years ago, there was a, a, a feeling that there would, that tuberculous meningitis would be a condition that could be considered for euthanasia because they felt there was just no way that that condition could ever be anything but fatal in a, in a very uncomfortable way for the patient. But by not having that option then, people started to, to discover methods for these treatments and as I say that the neurodegenerative ones today are the ones that are, are creating a tremendous amount of interest in terms of research and what we can do with these conditions. So I think that's the other dimension that might just reduce the incentive to find better cures and better palliative care treatments. But at the centre that you refer to yourself that the days when, when the patient was maybe not consulted, or certainly not the family were consulted. Times have changed. And patient choice and empowerment. Uh, why, why, why couldn't patient choice to take this road, good hospice, end of life care, and you know, the, the maximum, why, why would that be contradictory in the new relationships that we have with doctors and patients that patient choice would be the top priority in the uh, end of life? I think another component is the unpredictability of the, of the situation, the unpredictability, and, and, and really doctors, uh, even in malignant conditions, find it very difficult to estimate the, 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 the remaining part of your life and how the quality of that will be, whether it will continue to deteriorate or be at a level where it will, it will further deteriorate. So that is a, is a question that doctors have when they're giving patients advice from that point of view. And I think there's also the question of, the, we respect the autonomy of the patient, but there's the greater picture really of what that uh, decision would make on the, the greater body of patients. Uh, and we get very tragic uh, you know, individual cases which everybody really sympathises with, but whether these cases should lead to a, a major change for, for the whole population, I think is a question that doctors find very difficult. Yeah. Um, sorry, President, we, we, you know, we've, we've, we've had um, uh, situations in this committee where we've looked at access to new medicines and new drugs and aggressive, sometimes aggressive treatments that, that are uncertain sometimes lead to betterment, sometimes not, lead to severe and unpleasant end-of-life situations. It's all uncertain there, but, but people are encouraged and allowed to make that choice to get access to some of these medicines. 
we have got a hospice movement that we're very proud of in Inverclyde and elsewhere, and and we've we've got this part of of, of patient choice. I, I'm struggling to see the if 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 uh, the the relationship between the doctor and the patient and the patient's choice um, is in the society we live in to be assisted at the end of life or to access new and medicines or indeed you know, palliative care or all those choices would the doctors not support that all of those choices sit side by side and I think it's the, it's the fundamental nature of this this is something that, 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 that all of these options are that but it's the fundamental uh, decision about the doctor providing assistance or a facility is providing assistance to death, which the general practitioner will obviously have to have a role in, or, or, or doctors in other uh, environments will have to have a role in. It's that that a significant proportion or majority of, of the doctors my organisation find difficult. There are contrasting views, as we've emphasised, and views that I respect, and people that hold these views very clearly, that they think they can move to that stage where a facilitator can, can assist um, but the majority still feel that that's a bridge too far. Uh, uh, if I could uh, perhaps venture a speculative answer to that question. As a psychiatrist, I'm not in the front line of those decisions, but I work alongside doctors who are. Um, I, I think part of the fear in the, in the medical profession, if they mention the options of assisted suicide or indeed um, discontinuing life-sustaining treatment, is the patient might think, well, he's not fighting for me anymore. He's not pushing for me. He's given up on me. Um, and that, I, I think, is part of the, the fear that some doctors might bring of a loss of trust. It's something I've observed as a possibility, but I, I must stress I'm not in the front line of those decisions. Rhoda Grant. Um, can I ask the panel about the time limit, the 14 time limit between um, the second request and the act of committing suicide? Um, basically, two things. Why do you think that time limit is in the bill? And I, my, own, my own thoughts are it's because of medication being available and within the community. Is there another way of doing it? And could that time limit indeed force somebody's hand if they had made the second request, they had got their medication, but they knew they had to use it within 14 days or else that um, second request expired? Could that kind of force their hand in having to make a decision about whether to use the medication or not? Yes. Um, it's, it, the timing... It, it is difficult, as some colleagues have alluded to, um, with prognosis and all sorts. So to actually put numbers in the bill, I can understand, would be difficult. Um, f the, the, if, we were, if, if the legislation was going down the road of having medication as an option, the medication would, in all likelihood, not be readily available in the community and would need to be specially ordered for somebody. It would certainly take a few days to... Um, acquire and to, to be there and we we had a working group which looked uh, had pharmacists from right across the sector looking at this and 14 days in some ways is a fairly reasonable uh, number to plump on the prescriptions would probably only be valid for 28 days anyway so anything outside 28 days would, uh, uh, would be a new prescription what we did feel um with the, the bill as it stands at the moment is that there perhaps isn't enough emphasis on the fact that it's the person's own decision it would be and they could change their mind at any time. So the fact that they had made the second request were in that, second, that last 14 day period that would not stop somebody changing their mind and the whole premise of this would, is, is that somebody could change their mind right up to the very last instant it has to be their decision. So issuing a prescription and being in that 14 day period doesn't preclude a change of mind at any point and and I think there's been a bit of anxiety around that because that's not very clear in the way the bill's um, written at the moment. Does that answer your question there, Rhoda? Mm, that, that helps. But if, for instance, a prescription lasts 28 days, someone has the prescription because they've made the second request but decide not to draw it down or maybe swithering about whether this is the right time for them or whatever, um, and then present the prescription, say, on day 12, day 13, then discover it's going to take three or four days for that prescription to come, they are suddenly, you know, their second request has become cancelled or that they feel they 
have to immediately, on making the second request, draw down that prescription and take it because that time limit um, is so tight. Um, that doesn't give them time maybe to reflect properly and to, to assess whether that is the right time for them or not. Also, we submitted our policy to the, the committee as well. And part of the reason for developing that policy was to um, look at the practicalities of uh, this if the legislation were to be passed. And we, uh, you know, it's, we thank the committee for um, recognising that the role of pharmacists is imp would be important in this if the legislation went through. And we, we looked at all of those possibilities. Um, that was why we suggested frameworks where you would have a triangular agreement between the medical practitioner, the pharmacist and the facilitator. Okay. So um, we took a slightly different tack in that we envisaged something like if a person requested an assisted suicide procedure, the medical practitioner would then have, have conversations with a pharmacist and the prescription would be issued at the beginning with the 14 days to allow that to, to be acquired. But there would be conversations and dialogue working closely together with the professionals um, so that patients were not put to undue distress. This would not be a normal prescription in any shape or form. It would be quite different. And what we would want to avoid would be exactly that scenario that you, you, you've you described where somebody presented with a prescription in the normal way because this would have to be quite a different procedure and that's why we obviously all also advocated um, the need for a professional advisory panel so that we would have national guidance and protocols. Um, we wouldn't expect prescribers to do this alone. We feel there would need to be support and there would need to be robust procedures around this. And I, I, um, when you look at this, I find you get more questions than answers. So there would be a lot of issues and it would be, we asked for a multidisciplinary professional advisory panel to be written into the statute. And the details of that could be in the regulations underneath, but that would be somewhere where those decisions could be um, looked at and a framework which would be suitable would be able to be ironed out on a national basis. Okay. Um, I make a, a, a point about time limits. I think there have to be some time limits, a minimum and a maximum, but quite how they're set um, depends on a number of factors. Um, a short minimum allows for those who are deteriorating rapidly and suffering intensely to avail themselves of the possibility if it's there. But it might not allow enough room for review of the decision and the possibility of changing somebody's mind. A long maximum allows plenty of room for changing your mind and reviewing your decision, but it might um, mean that somebody who's deteriorating in mental capacity loses capacity and therefore can't avail themselves of the opportunity. Um, I don't have a, a view about 14 days versus 28 days, but I think there is another European jurisdiction, I think it's the Netherlands, where they have two time limits, one for when people are deteriorating rapidly. I think they have a 14-day and a six-day period written into their legislation, and it might be worth looking at something like that in, in amendment here. Thanks for that. Colin Kia. Thanks, convener. Uh, just to head back to something that was said a, a little bit earlier, and I'm just thinking in terms of... Um, the issue of trust, and uh, I think it was yourself, uh, uh, Dr. Potts, that said that um, you might be seen as not fighting for the patient if they start talking in terms of the um, uh, discussions with the person involved. In terms of palliative care, I wouldn't expect anyone within that environment to be even talking about uh, suicide. I'd be expecting the issue of suicide to come not from anybody within the professions, but from the only at the, the point where the patient is deciding himself that this is the final straw, and which case he's kind of gone past the point of, you know, professionals, I would suggest, fighting for him. You know, if he's gone through that palliative care uh, element, and I'm just trying to sort of get my head around the idea of when people get to the point where they see it as of no return, how do you feel that your professionals would be letting these people down uh, by whatever actions they take, so to speak? My point was made in response to Mr Doris's question about whether doctors should or should not raise the question of assisted suicide with a patient as one amongst a number of options. 
Mm. I mean, that, that's really the, the crux of the matter uh, when it comes to the professional involvement that I can see. Is I think this is something that has to be brought forward by the patient. I don't necessarily see if it's in terms of the palliative care movement and you talk about the trust issues and, you know, the, the um, awareness that people have about the suicide. If they're quite happy to go to end of life through the palliative care system, that's fine. But I think it's for them to bring it up, I would probably suggest. I, I tend to agree with you, but I'm not sure that that answers Mr. Doris's question. But it brings forward a different aspect of, you know, the effect of trust within yeah. the professional patient relationship. Yeah. If it's the patient that is determined to bring the issue up, mm -hmm. not the doctor. So frequently, uh, in my medical career, patients have said I've had enough, and they, and I and I in my own area of, of heart disease, patients can come in, you know, with really very disabling uh, symptoms, uh, and at times it seems to be the end of the road. And and in fact, you know, if this bill came in, then when they said that, you would have to really you know explore that with them. But but that that option isn't available, and therefore you explore other options. And many, on many occasions, in the vast majority of situations, you can make that patient comfortable. You can give them a, a quality of life continuing. And, and it's quite interesting to look at DNR notices that patients put on themselves. These, in quite a significant percentage of patients, are reversed as time goes on and they see that the effects of treatment are, are, are kicking in. So, so I think it is important that... that, that uh, and you understand when patients have had enough, but at times they've got the opportunity to, to, to review that. And, uh, you know, I think there is concern within the profession with the, with the assisted suicide that that option it might not be explored as thoroughly as, as it is now. Um, just on that, that subject of professional um, trust, um, we had palliative care specialist pharmacists on our group, and they were... Um, quite adamant that these are two completely separate procedures and there is a conflict of interest with so a palliative care pathway established end of life pathway is a totally separate procedure and should not be conf confused with an assisted suicide procedure and that you felt we felt quite clearly that patients should always be given the options of all the palliative care options available to them and that in, in places, I would agree with my colleague here, sometimes they're just not, they're not aware of the options. And some quite simple things, my understanding is that Dignitas have people um, who register with them, but they, they have some simple inquiries, which we would say were pharmaceutical care issues, which should be dealt with. And when those options are explored and dealt with, the patient would not be then requesting an assisted suicide procedure, and that happens often. So I think it highlights what was mentioned before, the need for resourcing palliative care adequately across the country, for having it across the different therapeutic areas and to have equity of access. And that's maybe something the committee will want to explore more when they speak to the palliative care specialists um, in, a few, in a few weeks' time. But I just agree with you that there are two completely separate pathways and the hospice pharmacist, palliative care uh, specialist pharmacist did not want to have their roles confused with an assisted suicide procedure because they did feel that would take away their lack of trust with their patients. Okay. Dennis Robertson. It was just um, a, a comment that was made when patients um, come and say, right, I've had enough, you know, it's the end of the line, I, I can't cope with this anymore. And perhaps, um, with the agreement, obviously, go to the sort of DNR, the sort of non resus in, in how many cases do people actually change their mind in terms of, you know, whether it's the individual or the, the families and carers that go through the discussion? How many, are we aware of how many people sort of opt out of the DNR once they've maybe entered into it? There are studies mainly fr from the US indicating a, a percentage that I think is around the 30% mark, um, but I would have to check on that. I, I had looked at this a number of years ago when there was... And, of course, the DNR issues are, are, is a different situation altogether, and it's one that we would, we would, we would obviously uh, you know, support the patient. And in many of these situations, the, uh, the vast majority, they're appropriate decisions, but they decide mm -hmm. for whatever reason that they want that lifted, and if the... If the if their carers feel that's appropriate, then that's what would happen. 
But with reference to the DNR, what, what I'm thinking is that at the moment there, there probably is still the possibility of making a patient comfortable, um, perhaps a, a, um, continuing life on whatever quality of life that is. And I, I'm not trying to reach the sort of parallel in terms of the, 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 the end of life sort of through the assisted suicide, but it does, it does strike me that, that there are patients already who are making decisions not to continue life, which is respected through the medical profession. Is that not the case? I think there are situations where the patient uh, may uh, want a decision reversed, but the, the decision, the ultimate decision in that regard would be uh, for the medical professionals. For example, if a patient said, I want to go on a ventilator, whatever happens here, then we have to try and counsel them and advise them that given the, their own situation, that would not give them any a improved quality of life or give them a better outcome. And in that situation, the, the professionals would have to make a decision, again, at all times uh, involving the patient and their family. Mm -hmm. But so that the, the DNR um, order uh, would be appropriate. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, Patrick, did you want to come in at this point? I'm going to call on Richard Simpson on the capacity issue that, on capacity that you dealt with in the first thing. But Patrick, do you? Thank you, convener. Just on this this question of trust, uh, like other members, I'm keen to to explore it. And um, Dr. Dunn, I think, began the session by talking about this trust relationship, uh, and and you raised this in in the context of describing assisted suicide. I think as a new concept. Can I suggest that? Actually, it's not. And uh, it goes beyond the, the fact that, as, as you say, in days gone by, uh, medical professionals might have excluded patients from decisions. Uh, actually, in, in days gone by, it may not have been legislated for, but th there is good evidence that it was fairly common practice that doctors might decide when it was the right time to end somebody's life and it would administer uh, a, a dose of a medication with that intent. Th there is good historical evidence that actually we're continuing with a, a, a legislative proposal like this, a trend away from the idea of an authoritative approach uh, where a, an authority figure will make decisions and impose them on individuals and toward a, a, a question of empowerment where individuals make their own choices. Uh, isn't that the, the, the basis of a healthier trust relationship? Uh, and in particular in this bill, the, the mechanism of the preliminary declaration which a person might have lodged in their medical records at any time in their life, perhaps when they're, they're, they're fit and well, perhaps when they don't anticipate that they have a, a, an imminent need to make a request for assistance. The ability to have that conversation with a doctor, the ability to have that conversation about a, a person's general attitude to these questions of, of life and death, uh, surely this could give rise to a, a stronger trust relationship between patient and doctor, one where uh, the, the patient knows that the doctor understands and respects uh, their approach to these questions. Yeah, when I said a new concept, I meant more that if this uh, bill were to come in, for doctors there would be a new issue to deal with with patients. So that, that was what I meant. I mean, I, you're absolutely right. This has gone back for many years now. I, I cited the fact that euthanasia was discussed in, in, in the early part of the 20th century, so it's not new. And I take the point about the importance of the patient autonomy and the fact that in days gone by, doctors hid information from the patients, even about things like their blood pressure. They wouldn't tell them what their blood pressure was. These days are gone. I think this is, for many and within the professional profession, such a fundamental issue because it's about assisting uh, the process of, of ending the patient's life. And this, for many doctors, is a very difficult concept. We, many of us, feel that you know, pursuing other avenues such as the palliative care environment uh, are the way forward and that this would diminish the chances of that. And I think there are other issues involved in it in terms of the fact that patients who uh, are extremely disabled can be huge contributors with the continuation of their life, not just to themselves, but also to to their families and to, and to the world, wider world. So there is, a, there is an issue about that, uh, uh, their contribution and the fact that patients, 
you know, that, 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 that reflect after a period of time, I'm glad that I didn't make that decision to end my life because of the contributions that we've made. And we know of many examples of this in motor neuron disease and people towards the end of their life in these conditions who have made huge contributions to society or actually improve society by their attitude towards their, their life-ending condition. And that door would be closed if there was a you know, widespread introduction of, of the assisted suicide. I would agree very strongly with the comments you make about the positive contribution that people make to society as well as to their own uh, family life. Uh, that, that's something that I suspect everybody would uh, agree with. Uh, I think that has to happen on people's own terms. But you, you've, you've, you've said again this, this suggestion uh, that the introduction of assisted suicide would lead to a, a reduction or a diminution in palliative care. Uh, can I ask what evidence do you have for that? The, the, I'm aware of significant body of research, and I can provide the committee with research references if that would be helpful, demonstrating that in jurisdictions which do have a form of, of legalised assisted suicide, uh, we don't see that. In fact, we see the opposite. In Belgium and the Netherlands, for example, since legislation was passed, we've seen an increase in investment in palliative care. In Oregon, there's also evidence demonstrating the high quality of palliative care uh, in that state compared with its neighbours, uh, and that the use of assisted dying legislation has, uh, is, is relatively low. Uh, we're not talking about a, a, a large number of people. We're talking about a relatively small number of people who'd be expected to... Uh, take up this option uh, and, and that again uh, slightly conflicts with your, your suggestion that we would see with a reduction in research uh, either in treatment or in cures. I think that's a concern. I think if we take examples of palliative symptoms like pain, you know, intractable pain or nausea, if there is an option that that pain, you know, that assisted suicide would, would relieve the pain then the incentive to do to have other measures in which that pain can be controlled would be diminished. That is a concern that we have. Uh, it's it's happened very, in very other difficult to get that evidence uh, at the moment for that because we don't have the option uh, of not pursuing it at the moment. Well, the palliative care team are doing everything they can to further develop yeah. methods of controlling pain. Can I just suggest to you, though, that there is strong evidence that in jurisdictions which do have a form of assisted suicide, we actually see an increase in investment in uh, palliative care uh, and other alternatives, not a reduction. But do we know that there is a, uh, that investment includes these intractable issues? That's the thing that we would need to look at. I, I see no reason to Im imagine that it wouldn't. We're talking about it. Uh, a high level of, of palliative care provision in, in Oregon, an increase in investment uh, in, in provision in Belgium and the Netherlands. These are some of the, the jurisdictions we cite most but I regularly. Think, I think the palliative encounters. care movement worldwide is being invested, so it's very difficult to know what that relationship is in these three particular constituencies. We, 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 we have representatives alone from the palliative care movement at some future sessions anyway, so we'll be able to explore that uh, further. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Richard? Yes. The area of cognitive impairment or capacity is a, is a difficult one. Um, I, I gather from what Dr. Potts is saying that uh, his members may be relieved to be removed from the Act as something, a, as a specific requirement, but my concern would be as to whether all my colleagues in general practice would actually have uh, the ability in these very delicate circumstances to assess mental capacity and whether it needs some more uh, specific determination either involving a lawyer or a medical practitioner with specific qualifications such as is required in the Mental Health Act for detention, for example, to sign part of that act, I think, uh, signed under that act, you still require to be registered for that purpose. So I just want to explore that a little bit further because the issue of cognition seems to me to be hugely important in determining uh, whether these individuals may be <clears throat> vulnerable um, in a way which um, means they're not making an, 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 a determination that's appropriate. That my colleagues and I are relieved to be um, relieved of the potential burden of decision-making about capacity in all cases routinely as a matter of course. We accept that we may well be involved in assessing capacity in a subset of cases. 
And I think the best way I can answer that is by reference to uh, renal units up and down the country which have large numbers of people on dialysis, a small proportion of whom will decide that they've had enough of dialysis, they want to stop, and in, they do so in the full knowledge that they will die within a matter of days, perhaps weeks afterwards. Renal physicians are uh, well capable of assessing their capacity in the main, but if there's a question of cognitive impairment or lowering of mood or a history of psychotic symptoms, they may, may well call in psychiatrists to assist with the assessment of capacity and therefore the decision making. That's the model that I and my colleagues would have in mind for this uh, legislation if it's to be passed. We would expect to be involved in a proportion of cases. It's hard to judge how many it would be, but not as a matter of routine in all cases where there's no question of mental disorder or impaired cognition, even though the results, by definition, will be fatal, as they are for withdrawing dialysis. That's very helpful. Anybody else on the panel? Hmm. Richard? I think Dr. Dunn might oh, sorry, bear yeah, back yeah. to just, help us. Just really, I mean, in this whole area, again, we're, we're, we're into a situation of a very delicate area where the palliative care physicians clearly have the, the expertise. And it may well be that many general practitioners don't have that level, and yet at the end of the day, the, 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 the onus in many situations will fall on, on the general practitioner. So whether we have a... <coughs> A, a, enough individuals really to deal with this area that are, are trained. There would need to be specific training for doctors uh, at the primary care level as well to enter into these discussions with the palliative care. I mean, I know in my own uh, specialty, again, that, that, that uh, our ability as palliative care doctors in cardiology is, is, uh, was, was greatly uh, weakened, really, until we, we spoke to palliative care doctors and learned all the things that could be done to, to help the patient's symptoms so that in non-malignant conditions, again, they can provide the expertise that cardiologists don't have, and uh, that's something that's become very evident. So there is a real art in the whole palliative care environment. Richard, Rhoda Grant. Can I just ask, just following on a question that was put forward earlier, when people, you know, obviously losing physical capacity or the like, or kind of difficult conditions, say, I've had enough, um, what assessment can be done under this legislation to kind of say, well, actually, maybe not, if you were given the support, the palliative care, or indeed new treatments or whatever. I mean, everyone comes to a point where they maybe are sick, fed up of the condition. But if they were then allowed to pursue an assisted suicide rather than have um, other options explored with them, how, how do you stop them falling through the net? People who maybe are depressed by their condition, people who are getting older um, get depressed because they know that their strength is not going to return, they're going to continue to decline. How, how can GPs, doctors, the like, make that assessment that this is maybe a passing phase of coming to terms with your illness or your declining abilities um, and not something that you might wish to continue with? Um, I would say that's the everyday work of psychiatrists working in the speciality of liaison psychiatry in the general hospital is to try and help the patient and the treating doctors come to a judgment about whether Indeed, this is a passing phase or a settled view. And it is not easy, it's not an exact science, and we will get it wrong. Um, in preparation for this meeting, I, I reviewed um, case records from my department in the last 10 years or so. 25 to 30,000 cases referred to us. In only two w was part of the referral an explicit request for um, assisted suicide, at a time, obviously, when it was not legal. In both cases, the patients were seriously ill. Um, both would have qualified under the terms of this legislation for assisted suicide, and both had depressive illnesses. But after assessment, we were clear that the, the, the depression, as clear as we could be, that the depression was not influencing their decision making. And if assisted suicide had been available at the time, they would have availed themselves of it. That kind of assessment is not easy, takes time, take consultation with others, but it's, it's a, it's a, it would follow as the clinical work that would be required if this bill is passed. 
and we will have to develop our skills further in, um, in accepting Parliament's will uh, for the benefit of the patients that we're trying to help. Anyone else? Bob Doris. Thanks, Convener. Um, just going to hear some of the, the, the answers there. I'm just wondering, in, in relation to the, again, the, the, the doctor relationship with, with, with the patient, there can be a number of factors out with the, uh, the, 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 the mental state of, 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 of the patient. For example, um, palliative care frameworks could be better in one part of the country compared to another, or for one condition compared to another. Um, the, the pharmaceutical uh, management of some individuals may be superior than for others, or the social care support that local authorities provide uh, may vary as well. I'm just wondering if there would be any concerns about the likelihood for certain individuals to seek assisted suicide may be determined by other social factors su such as the quality of care provision or the investment in palliative care for, 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 for various uh, life-limiting or terminal conditions? That's, you know, that, that, that's a very fair uh, comment and I'm sure there is differences throughout the country in all of these, these issues and, and obviously the patients that are best looked after with optimal palliative care are the ones that are, are likely to continue down that road and those that are, are not would be would be more discouraged and perhaps can uh, consider the option of, of assisted suicide if that were available so i think again it emphasizes the importance of having you know our, our services uh, very equal uh, throughout the country and uh, that's something that i know that we're all aiming for but that i agree that could well influence a patient's decisions there was, if there, I don't know if there's any other comments on that. There was a slight other supplementary convener. Yeah, uh, it was in relation to whether uh, the, a psychiatrist should make a determination in relation to capacity in, in every occasion or some occasions. I think the, the last evidence session a suggestion was made under the legislative provisions as, as things stand just now. Uh, one, one of the witnesses suggested there could, there could be a, a legal necessity for uh, at, at the first stage for there to be a determination by a, 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 a psychiatrist. So whether, uh, I mean, Dr. Potts, you think it's always necessary or desirable, it may, in legal terms, it, it may or may not be required. But I, I, guess, I guess I was also thinking about where um, the, this law could be challengeable. And uh, again, doctors who don't um, refer onward to a psychiatrist for a psychiatric assessment and then family members or others seek to challenge the validity of the decision taken where, where the, the patient ultimately goes ahead and, 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 and uh, has an assisted suicide. I wonder if there's any concerns. And I take on board the points you're making, Dr. Potts, whether there's concerns in terms of protecting your profession or protecting doctors who don't do an onward referral to, for a psychiatric assessment. Um. I don't think there needs to be an automatic recourse to psychiatric assessment at any stage, but psychiatric assessment has to be available to the doctors seeing the patients at every stage. Whether or not a decision is open to legal challenge um, is probably better for a lawyer to comment upon, um, but we don't have a concern now that when a patient says, I want to stop dialysis, and a doctor agrees that that decision is open to legal challenge. We don't require that doctor always to refer every such patient to a psychiatrist. Um, and probably half the patients in my hospital in that condition do not get referred to my department, and I accept that. I don't see any reason clinically and with an amateur's understanding of the law why it would be necessary to make it automatic. I suppose the question is, with, with, you know, with the change in nature and legislation and the law, would, would that make it more likely that, that people within, caught within that process, the GP or the, you know, some other medical person involved, he would seek that reassurance to ensure that there was no future liability on him or her? I suppose that was a, the, 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 what was being said this morning. 
in advance of legislation and a code of practice and then it actually being seen to work, it's very hard to know what proportion of cases would trigger a referral to psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I suspect that cautious GPs and cautious doctors would refer quite a high proportion. Um, and then if, if this is bedded down into practice, the, the proportion might go down over time. But that's pure speculation on my part. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But there is a high, you know, high anxiety among the professions that, you know, that issue of capacity and, um, you know, don't, you know. Uh, I, I would expect a psychiatric referral in any person requesting assisted suicide where they appear to be significantly depressed at the time, where there was a history of depression, where there's evidence of cognitive impairment, where they're on antidepressants, where they're on antipsychotics, um, and that might account for most people but not automatically for everybody. But you wouldn't want a blanket ban on people with mental health problems as access to, if this became... Um, I think the difficulty there is potentially a significant one in that my psychiatric colleagues will have as an everyday experience seeing people with depressive illnesses who will say things like, my life is intolerable, I can't go on, I'd be better off dead, please let me die. These are people who don't have qualifying physical conditions and where the job of psychiatrists every day is to treat them, sometimes against their will under mental health legislation, mm -hmm. in the full expectation that they will recover from this episode as they have recovered from all their previous episodes. And if the psychiatrists are being asked to enforce treatment on people with depressive illnesses in those circumstances and to essentially authorise um, assisted suicide in other cases with physical disorder, it's a very acute dilemma and I don't know how as a profession we're going to resolve it. I'm prepared to assist in that process if uh, the legislation is passed and code of practice needs to be written, but mm. might need some time. But <laughs> do you all then believe that there needs to be, you know, enhancement of the protections you've mentioned? Um, a lot would depend on the code of practice, uh, whether it, it's necessary to build in protections in statute. Um, I am undecided about, and my college is undecided about. No other comments on that? No, I think, I think that, that this is a, a huge dilemma, particularly for our colleagues who have to, you know, uh, patients who have got major psychotic illnesses have to be, uh, have to have treatment against their, their will, uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore you're preventing these patients uh, uh, taking their own lives. And yet, in other situations, would be asked to, to assist in the process. So I think that is part of the dilemma that we have. Have there any other questions from committee members at this point? I haven't, so I'm going to give uh, the opportunity of uh, the member, Patrick Harvey, to ask some questions at this point before we proceed to closure. Thanks. I'm, I'm grateful, convener. Uh, just to pick up, first of all, on that, that last point you were, you were raising yourself, um, Dr. Potts, I assume that you would uh, also acknowledge that the, there could be many patients with uh, a diagnosis of a mental illness, with a, a history of uh, uh, episodes which have not recurred for some considerable time, uh, and that in, in circumstances like that, if Parliament was to agree the principle uh, of, of legislation in this area, a blanket ban on patients with mental illnesses in general would not be appropriate. It would be unsustainable and inappropriate, yes. Thank you. And... Can I take you one step beyond that and ask whether, uh, whether you would look at the evidence from other jurisdictions, for example, uh, the high proportion of people in Oregon who, under the Death with Dignity Act, do acquire uh, a prescription for uh, a lethal dose of medication uh, with the intention of taking it should they reach that point, but who then don't do so. Uh, and and other, other jurisdictions where, where the experience is that people, knowing that they have the option, uh, actually helps them to, to face the experience that they're going through. Yes. Is, is that something that you would recognise? Uh, I am familiar with that evidence and I, I do recognise it, yes. <laughs> I wonder if I can ask uh, Dr Dunn as well then to, to reflect on that, um, uh, that argument that uh, for, for some patients, knowing that they have the option to ask for assistance should they reach that point uh, is something which benefits them uh, and, and their ability to uh, deal with and to, and to live through uh, the experience they're going through. 
Well, I think if patients have, 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 have let us know that this actually did help them through the process, then obviously that would ha have to be acknowledged. And it's just a question of balancing that against those who, who uh, you know, as it were, make the decision. We'll never know whether they would have re reflected on it or not. But uh, you know, I, I certainly acknowledge that that, that that evidence is in existence, that it does help some people, if they're faced with it, to say, well, this is not the route for me. To, to pick up on the point that Bob Doris raised about social factors and social circumstances, um, in, in looking at the, the, the definition of uh, life-shortening uh, conditions in, in, in the bill, um, could I ask what your view would be about whether, whether a condition itself should, lead, should be required to lead to the shortening of somebody's life expectation, or whether the social circumstances, perhaps the discrimination they might encounter, uh, the uh, um, likelihood they are to live in poverty or to be una unable to work. There's a distinction, isn't there, between whether the condition itself directly shortens somebody's life or whether the condition is associated with social circumstances which might have the same effect. Uh, is, is this an area where slim, simply a, a slightly clearer definition would be helpful in, in determining which conditions uh, meet that test? Yeah, I think, I think that it's, it's a package, really. I mean, it's how a patient responds and how a patient responds to an illness will depend on the support, will depend on their social circumstances and many other factors. Uh, so I think it's very difficult to say, uh, to focus purely on the condition. I think it's the whole support network that they find themselves in, how they're coping with it, their coping strategies down the years that may have been influenced by that. So. So I think it's certainly the disease is at the centre of it, but all these other factors will play a, a part in, in, in their decision making. It, it's well recognised that it's life shortening to live in certain deprived areas in Scotland. Uh, and there'll be few people my age and older who don't have at least one life shortening condition, whether it's diabetes or hypertension or asthma or emphysema or depression indeed. Um, and I think that means that the, the term life-shortening is drawn so broadly as to be, be difficult to make work in this legislation. And my view is that it need, the definition needs to be tightened and revised. But it's, it's presumably something which is quite open to amendment. It, it's, it's achievable to, to tighten that definition in the legislation. Um, I hesitate to answer that without trying. <laughs> OK, well, hopefully we'll get to that point. Uh, and finally, uh, I think Aileen Bryson mentioned the, the issue of time limits earlier on or responded to a question on that uh, and talked about um, whether other jurisdictions might have two different time limits for different circumstances. The assisted dying bill, which is currently being considered by the House of Lords, uh, includes the option to accelerate the time scale, so uh, a shorter time scale uh, in certain circumstances where that was deemed appropriate, perhaps due to, to an individual patient's prognosis. Is that the kind of approach that you would be seeking in this bill? I think Dr Dunn, I, oh, I think I think Dr. Dunn actually mentioned that. Um, um, I talked in general about the difficulty of actually putting numbers in, in, into the bill, but I was talking about the prescriptions and the practicalities. But I think, Francis, it was you that mentioned the jurisdictions do have the, was it the Netherlands and their six days. I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, would, did somebody want to, to respond on that on that point? The the assisted dying bill sets out a, a, a time scale, but then uh, defines circumstances in which it could be accelerated. Is that what you're seeking in in this bill? I, I'm not seeking anything in this bill. I'm just pointing out a comparison with other jurisdictions where it is a provision, and I uh, I think I understand the reasons why it's provision. And therefore, the question needs to be raised whether it's, it's worth amending this bill to incorporate it or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and can I thank the, the, the witness panel and all who have attended here this morning and your written evidence uh, has been appreciated. Um, thank you very much indeed for giving us your valuable time here this morning. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to suspend at this point. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to you know, clear the room quite quickly and I'll, I'll, I'll limit a 10 minutes just in reflection of the evidence sessions, in private, so uh, which, is, which, is, which we have previously agreed is in private.